Scottsdale, that's the upscale of, of uh, Phoenix. Yeah. <laughs> no. No way. See, that's me. Jesus. See. Kevin or G. That's my Mr. G. Is my. Uh, I don't. I don't. Appreciate you. Good. Thanks a lot, John. It's been a. Thank you. Frustrating. Two weeks. But you know, that's when you have to hang in there. Because at that point, it's all perseverance. Is this you, Cheryl? Oh, that's all right. That's all right. I just know if this is my pitch. Oh, yeah. I brought it in. I have the right to. I just dropped it. Okay. Okay. So I want to steal your stuff. You're prepared. Hi, what are this? Who's on camera? Wait a minute. I see some little kid on camera. No, basically, it's just. A bunch of stuff. I read them. I read them. I don't know. Yeah, I think part of my stuff printed and somehow it is. So basically, I Okay, so you, 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 was there a budget question? Uh, no, 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 no. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I might, if, if I can see, let me see if Tom can go get you another one. Yeah. 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 I see you right there. So I'll leave that out, but I just know that that's like a hat. Dust. Dust, dust. So I just, I had to take a little while. I'm so proud of you. They're great. It's a fantastic team. Bring it out. Just for the rest of my and added intervention to Math 180, which is at the other schools already. So, excuse me. Here. <coughs> so when they take that away, they're definitely going to need the intervention in addition to adding uh, the other math. Mm -hmm. So that was true. Mm -hmm. wow. That's amazing. Oh, I'm fine, right. huh? It was, uh, she said 200 
25,000. You should ask Brenda. Brenda Myers announced it in the meeting, so it's public. Uh, so ask, she's right up there. So, um, it's, a, it's like a So we're honoring Honus for their accomplishment in STEM. And a lot of the kids in the crowd are from Kenya. The kids in the crowd are from Kenya. Oh, because there's a bow on the Yeah. The young lady in the room. Okay, let's call the meeting to order at 7.09, and let's start with the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Best pledge ever. I know, it's always so nice to hear the pledge. I'm telling you, know kids making the pledge. <laughs> All right, and then I will turn it over to Mr. Azima for Spotlight. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. The Norwalk Board of Education is proud to recognize students from Ponus Ridge Steam Academy who were named winners of the Samsung Solve for Tomorrow contest. This nationwide contest is designed to boost interest and proficiency in STEM which stands for science, technology, engineering, and math. Additionally, the competition challenges teachers and students in grades six through 12 to show how STEM can be applied to help improve their local community. The Ponus Tech team was selected as a contest winner for an invention idea that could help protect foster kids. Once a foster child himself, Ponus student Emrar Charles, along with his team members, helped develop a concept for monitoring a foster child's heart rate. The idea is based on finding a way to alert authorities when a foster child encounters a potential unsafe situation. While Emrard's foster experience was a positive one, his knowledge of others having had negative foster experiences 
prompted the idea. As a result of winning the contest, the school will receive 15,000 worth of technology and classroom supplies with more prizes up for grabs as the team advances. The next step for the team is to prepare a presentation that could possibly be shared with members of Congress. The Board of Education thanks gifted and talented teacher, Ms. Jen Nealon, and social studies and science teacher, Mr. Joe, Jim Mr. G, Mr. G, <laughs> for their dedication to the Ponus Rich Team students. Our goal at Ponus Rich Team Academy is to provide a rigorous curriculum that utilizes STEAM lessons and strategies to engage students. This project is exactly the type of hands-on learning that we are looking for students to experience. The Board of Ed congratulates these Pona students who worked hard to develop a potential solution to an issue that may foster children face, that may, to an issue that many foster children face each day. We are happy to have them here with us this evening to demonstrate their project in person. I'd like to invite up now Mr. Emmar Charles, Olivia McDowell, and Steven Geraldo up to the front of the room. a little um, overwhelmed we didn't realize that the crowd would be so large but um, I could say from my point working with the students it started last year um, MR had an idea for invention convention and continued to work over it over the summer and then just kind of by luck I received a postcard um, asking if I'd be interested in entering the contest and I spoke with Dr. Lewis who has been amazing to, um, supporting Miss Nealon and I and the team and it just kind of went from there MR has been able to share a story we've been um, featured on channel 12 We've also been featured um, a very quick story on Channel 8. Um, and it really came from MRR. Um, the students themselves have designed an app that we're still working on building. We're in the process of shooting a video to move to the next level. Um, and it's really been something that's been pretty much 99.9% .9 student driven. And Ms. Nealon and I are just kind of, you know, when they get a little off course, give them a little steer back in the right direction. And they've really just, you know, done everything wonderfully. The, today they were recording some of their voiceovers for the video um, at Ponus today. And it, it's just been amazing to see everything has just been this organic growth of, you know, here's the problem. And um, it really connected to MR's um, past. And he really has just run with it. So I think he's a little, a little shy right now in front of everybody. But um, MR really has done a wonderful job leading the team. And I couldn't be prouder to be part of MRX team um, and part of Polis. We have certificates for you. Could you um, come up and shake the hands of the board, please? And we have certificates for you as well, yes. Okay. Remember, you're going to shake everyone's hands and pick up your Congratulations. Congratulations. That's what you want. I want a double handshake. Nice job. Thank you, Joel. Thank you. Okay, and now we are going to move on to public comment, and I would actually just like to make a quick little statement that we, you might notice that public comment is a little different on the agenda than it usually is. Uh, we have public comment here up front, and although we have not put this through policy committee yet, we would, it's a request that people stick to agenda topics at the upfront public comment part, and then at the end, if there are other topics that people would like to address the board about, there's another period of public comment at the end. It's a request. Um, we haven't read it through policy committee, but if it's possible for people to to stick to that format, that would be great. Um, and I will bounce it over to you. So first up, we yes. No, it's a suggestion for now. It's just a suggestion for now, and we're we're working out the kinks to see what works best for the format. So for this evening. That's, it's just a request on the, on the part of the board. So, so if we don't follow this, it's okay? If you don't follow it, it's okay. Okay. 
I'd like to call up Elijah Fitchett of 32 Golden Hill Street. Good evening, Board of Education. My name is Elijah and I'm in fourth grade at Kendall School. <coughs> I will be talking about the pros and cons of the Above the Bar program and the three new things we are doing at Kendall School. This includes the Yale Ruler, Family Style Lunch, and Enrichment Clusters. One of the clusters we do at Kendall is Kids Talk which is a talk show where we get to talk about our own talk, to topics. We, we research these topics and they give us an idea of what jobs we may want in the future. The Yale Ruler is a mood meter. It helps teachers and students express what they're feeling. For example, yellow is high energy and it's positive. Green is low energy and it is also positive. Red is high energy but it's negative. Lastly, blue is low energy and also negative. A major pro about the Above the Bar program is the balance calendar. The balance calendar helps because we don't have we, we don't have big breaks. With a smaller summer break, we will be able to review lessons quicker so that we can learn new things sooner. The only, the only con I can see is that family tra families travel during the summer or sign up for other programs. That would cause them to miss school. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. Good evening, board. My name is Jules Duget. I'm part of the Kendall leadership team. I'm also the school social worker. I'm just summarizing the translation by Elijah. He, uh, in Spanish. Oh, El nombre de él es Elijah. Y él es un estudiante de Kendall. Él desea que le pase una buena noche a la junta de la educación y también quería mostrarle la necesidad de y importancia de tener el programa contra el año en su escuela. Él encuentra que hay programas como el programa llamado Cluster, que es para los niños que necesitan avanzar en cosas y ideas que le eh, gusten. También indicó que había importancia en el programa de Yale Ruler, donde pueden utilizar sus emociones para expresar cómo se sienten. Él encuentra muchas ventajas en tener estos programas en su escuela y ve que controlando sus emociones le ayuda a él y a todos los otros niños. Él encuentra que teniendo un calendario balanceado también es una ventaja porque le permite tener eh, algunos tiempos fuera de la escuela sin tener mucho apuro. Él ve una desventaja para las familias que tienen niños que pueden perder tiempo, pero lo ve como un alcance para él lograr lo que quiere con su educación. The next person I have to call up is Alyssa Harry. Good evening, Board of Education. My name is Alyssa Harry and I'm in the third grade. I go to Kendall Elementary School. I want to talk about family style lunch. Family style lunch is when the food is at the table, family style, and an adult is at each table to help. Something cool is that you don't have to line up to get your food. It has helped us learn important manners. It, has, it helps us appreciate lunch and get to know each other more. Students appreciate it more because they can better enjoy the food. Last year, many students would drop their food. I want to thank my favorite principal, Mrs. Baker, for encouraging us to come to this meeting tonight. I also want to give my teacher, Mrs. Scott Amachi, and my mom, Liz Harriet, a special shout out because they're always supporting me.
Mi nombre es Alisa Harry, estoy en el grado 3, asisto a Kendo. Quiero conversar un poquito de lo que es la comida de estilo de familia. La comida estilo de familia es algo que a nosotros nos gusta mucho porque nos traen comida a la mesa. Es con un adulto que comparte con nosotros. Nosotros lo vemos divertido porque tenemos que hacer una fila, no tenemos que esperar por la comida porque todo nos espera en la mesa. Quería no también eh, saber que eso nos ayuda a cómo comportarnos y también agradecemos que la comida es algo que nosotros podemos agradecer como estudiantes. Nosotros queremos agradecer también que durante el tiempo de la comida, el año pasado, muchos de los estudiantes no podían comerse la comida. Pero ahora sí encuentro que gracias a mi principal favorita, la señora Baker, por ella encontrar esto y ella invitarme esta noche. Y también le quería mandar un saludo a mis profesoras especiales que quiero mucho, a la señora Scaramacha y a mi madre, la señora Liz Harry, que le quiero desear todo lo mejor. The next person I'd like to call up is Zamara Lava. Laura? She's amazing. 35 Coach Street. <laughs> Good evening, Board of Education. My name is Amira, and before I start, I just wanted to thank you all for being here tonight and giving me this opportunity to be here too. Now I'm gonna continue with my real speech. <laughs> I, am in, I am in third grade and I go to Kendall Elementary School, and this year I became an ambassador, as our principal call, calls us. The meaning of ambassador to me is a child whose voice is being heard. I'm not saying that a child who is not an ambassador do not have voices. Furthermore, an amazing privilege of being an ambassador is the fact that your voice is truly heard. And in my opinion, all our voices are important and they should all be heard, right? Mm -hmm. And now I want to give some special shout outs to my family, my principal, Ms. Harry, my fellow ambassadors, including my best friend, Alyssa, my teacher, Ms. Grossman, and to Elijah. Thank you. Just, I just want to <clears throat> point out, um, and I explained this to um, see more before we started, um, apparently there is a large group of parents assembled at the school tonight watching this on television, mm -hmm. and there are others at home, and it was their request that the remarks concerning Kendall tonight be translated into Spanish, so mm -hmm. that's why we're, Sarah, we're, yeah. we're doing this. something before they continue? Sure, go ahead. <clears throat> Um, quiero decir muchas gracias para traducir a las familias de Norwalk. Eh, soy nueva aquí a la Junta de Educación. Soy latina. Estoy tomando notas. Voy a hablar con todos los miembros aquí para estar seguro que todas las familias de Norwalk son oídos. Mm -hmm. Si necesitan hablar conmigo, en mi número, mi correo electrónico está en el website. Se pueden comunicar conmigo con cualquier pregunta o problema que pueden tener. Pero muchas gracias por traducir para las familias que no están aquí y que no entienden inglés. Por nada. <risa> Buenas noches, Junta de Educación. Mi nombre es Samira. Estoy en el grado número 3 y asisto a Kendo. Yo soy una embajadora de mi escuela, como mi principal me ha nombrado. El significado de embajadora para mí como niña es tener una voz para que se pueda escuchar. Yo sé que hay muchos niños que no son embajadores porque no tienen voces, pero son algo que deben de ser orgullosos de tener el privilegio de ser un embajador, que sin embargo es cuando su voz se puede escuchar. En mi opinión, todas las voces son importantes y todas necesitan ser escuchadas, ¿verdad? Y por eso le quería desear lo que le doy un shout out especial a mi principal, a la señora Harry, a los otros embajadores, incluyendo a mi mejor amiga Alisa, a mi profesora la señora Grossman y a mi amigo Elijah. Gracias. I'd like to call Tatiana Smalls.
Good evening, Board of Education. My name is Tatiana Smalls, and I am speaking as one of the members of the PTA at Kendall Elementary School. Um, I would like to speak about the balanced calendar and the enrichment clusters that are going on. So in regards to the enrichment clusters, um, they do propose a lot of self-esteem for the children. Um, my child is in the first grade, and it really has boosted his um, self-esteem, also his willing to learn. Um, he does a lot more of social-emotional skills now that he is a part of that. Um, he's excited to talk about it. He loves school. Um, it's different than just regular academics for him, so he's excited about something else. Um, also, for low-income families who may not have the chance to participate in other things after school or even during the summer, um, that's a real great opportunity for them and their children to experience something like that and, again, be excited to talk about it. And that's why I believe in the balanced calendar because, again, during the summer, while a lot of other children are are able to take advantage of different summer programs such as camp or just even regular vacations. Low-income families can't do that. Um, I am a single mother, um, so I, I do my best to get him to do a lot of things, but it does, it does help the families and the children. And that just goes back to, again, the self-esteem. When they get to go back to school, they still have something to talk about. Um, and also for Caleb, he does have some learning disabilities. So for him, it's very easy to regress over that long summer break that normal public schools generally have. So the balanced calendar really is going to help Caleb out because I do look out for programs over the summer for him that are academic based, which um, Kendall is awesome about. So the fact that there's going to be a balanced calendar, that will give him less time to regress, but at the same time, give him extra time to get the help that he needs during the regular school year because of the smaller breaks that they have um, in the extended school year itself. So I wanted to thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Es la madre, la señora Tatiana Smalls, es una pariente de un niño del primer grado en la escuela de Kendall. Ella quería desearle una buena noche a la junta y en resumen explicarle lo, por qué es necesario tener un calendario balanceado en las escuelas de Novo. Encuentra que es una ventaja, por tanto, de los programas que tienen, igual a lo que le está ayudando a los otros niños, igual como al propio hijo de ella, con lo que es lo social y emocional. Eso ayuda a que el niño tenga alto estima, se sienta seguro de él o de ella misma, y que, anda, y, y que también tenga oportunidades que puedan alcanzar programas que realmente a veces no lo tienen. Ella piensa también que es importante tener un programa como este, porque para familias de poco ingreso también encuentra que es una ventaja a donde ella van a tener oportunidad de tener un programa durante horas y en el verano especialmente donde realmente muchas familias como la de ella propia no la tienen. Teniendo programas sobre el año con el calendario balanceado permitirá que su propia situación con su hijo que tiene sus propias necesidades sería algo importante porque durante el tiempo del de verano siempre ten, tiene la tendencia de volver a normalizarse en cosas que realmente no puede. Ahora con un programa como este que tengan un calendario balanceado tiene oportunidad de alcanzar sus metas, tener programas que realmente ella no podía tener y que otros y otras familias puedan tener ahora oportunidades donde realmente no se puedan brindar. Thank you. Ann Hennessy. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ann Hennessy, and I am a Norwalk resident. My husband and I purchased a home here in Norwalk a little over three years ago, and along with being a wife and a proud educator in the New York City Department of Education, for the last 12 years, my most important job is a parent. My son Camden is five years old and is currently a kindergarten student at the amazing Kendall Elementary School, where college and career begin. For my son, attending Kendall is a choice and a decision to advocate for my child, his needs, and the overall school community. We are not zoned to Kendall, 
But as my son has an IEP and requires the support of a co-taught classroom, my family was given the option to register him at Kendall in the only district co-taught classroom. So I did my homework. I spoke with current students, visited Kendall, and researched the above the bar grant Kendall was awarded. As an educator, in I was satisfied and decided to enroll my son at Kendall. My son transitioned from NECC to Kendall, and since August 2019, not only has my son shown a great deal of individual academic and social emotional growth and progress, but I have been quite happy with Kendall's school community and the persistence and dedication to having all students achieved by Kendall's teachers, staff, and administration. While Kendall has undergone transitions and changes this year connected to the Above the Bar grant, it is very clear to me that every decision has been made with every student's best interest at the forefront and inclusive of Kendall's parents and families. As a member of Kendall's wonderful PTA and School Governance Council, I have witnessed firsthand the communication between administration and families, keeping parents informed and sharing out next steps, but also soliciting feedback, questions, and concerns as an open dialogue about school community decisions, such as the balanced calendar, new curriculum and instructional methods, and the new enrichment opportunities for Kendall students. To provide students with those academic experiences and implement, implement the school-wide enrichment model, Kendall added 18 new certified teachers and staff members who support the Above the Bar initiative and, like myself, made the choice to join the Kendall community and family. The students of Kendall Elementary are also enthusiastic and excited about the opportunities the Above the, Above the Bar initiative has provided with them so far, as evidenced by the new student-run talk show, Kids Talk. On a recent episode of Kids Talk, students were able to identify a greater connection this year to Kendall's school community because of new initiatives, such as Family Style Lunch, a favorite of my son, which I hear about every day, Ruler, and Enrichment Clusters. As someone who personally is professionally trained at Yale in their ruler approach and has seen the positive impact on my very own school community in the Bronx with giving students the skills and tools to express themselves emotionally and in social situations, there is a measurable value this program is bringing to Kendall students and their emotional intelligence. Increasing emotional awareness and intelligence creates a safe space for students to take academic risks in the classroom and builds a student's self-confidence. These initiatives students with equitable access to the best programs, staff, experiences, and path to college, just as the balanced calendar will do. As Kendall's SGC chair and advocate for my child, I fully support the balanced calendar as part of the Above the Bar initiative. Research evidence and data prove that a balanced calendar will reduce the summer slide, where students lose academic knowledge and skills because of the lack of formal education exposure during an extended eight-week summer vacation. My son and your children cannot afford to take steps backwards, fall behind a grade level in reading, or forget a mathematical practice or strategy. Today's ever-changing and competitive work and career world won't allow for it. My family is willing to move our summer vacation plans, rearrange childcare, and be more involved because of the greater good the balanced calendar will provide my son and the Kendall community. While fears and concerns to address and details and dollars to still figure out as with any new initiative the big must be kept in clear vision Kendall students are worth it the Kendall community is ready to support students in bringing their goals and dreams to life even if it means stepping away from the norm going against the grain of traditional schooling and thinking outside of the box thank you Buenas noches, Junta de Educación. Mi nombre es Anne Hennessy y soy una residente del de pueblo de Novo. Mi esposo y yo recientemente compramos una casa en Novo hace tres años atrás y yo soy una esposa y también soy bien orgullosa de ser una educadora en el programa de educación en la ciudad de Nueva York por los últimos 12 años. Es muy importante para mí como padre que mi hijo de 5 años, Camden, que es recientemente estudiante en Kendo como de Kindle, pueda tener alcances y logros donde se comienza la universidad y la carrera. Para mi hijo, atender esa escuela fue algo de, de yo elegir, no fue una decisión que yo pude abocar por mi hijo y sus necesidades y sobre todo la comunidad de la escuela. Como no vivo en la zona de Kendo, 
tuve que aceptar que mi hijo, que tiene su propio plan individual, él requiere los soportes necesitados en lo que es una, un salón eh, prevenido con dos profesores. Mi familia y yo tuvimos la opción y no registramos en la escuela. No solo porque era el distrito, pero honestamente tuve mis reservaciones hasta cuando pude asistir y ver por, con mis propios ojos. Nosotros estudiamos todo y cuando yo como padres también hablé con estudiantes, visité la escuela y ahora con lo que se llama el alcance sobre la barra, pude también analizar lo que iba a hacer. Como una educadora y padre, me siento muy satisfecha en mi decisión de enrolar mi hijo en esa escuela. Mi hijo ha transicido de la NECC y ahora está en Kendo desde el 2019 en agosto. No solo es porque mi hijo ha podido lograr individualmente, eh, académicamente y también tener logros emocionales y sociales. Y en su progreso yo me siento muy satisfecha con la comunidad de Kendo. Ellos son presidentes y se dedican a todos los estudiantes, especialmente los maestros y las personas que trabajan, incluyendo la administración. Sobre todo, la escuela ha tomado muchos cambios y durante ese tiempo, en lo que llamamos eh, sobre la barra, fue muy claro para mí que la decisión fue hecha para mi hijo y también para los estudiantes y los mejores interés de ellos inclusive a, a los padres de Kendos y sus familias. Como una miembra de lo que es la PTA, que es donde nosotros gobernamos la escuela con los padres, yo he visto con mis propios ojos que la comunidad y la comunicación entre administración y familia es genuina. Nosotros nos mantenemos informados y sabemos de todos los pasos mientras vayan sucediendo. Si hay preguntas o tenemos algunas eh, pretensias, también hay un diálogo que se abre con la comunidad, con las decisiones para lo que se va a hacer durante el año y sobre todo con el calendario balanceado. Nosotros estamos buscando oportunidades y en la escuela de Kendo se brindan muchas para proveerle a los estudiantes experiencias académicas que puedan implementar con los modelos que tienen ellos. Ellos tienen 18 nuevos profesores que están dedicados a lo que es sobre la barra. Esa iniciativa, incluyéndome a mí, estoy muy satisfecha con la decisión de yo ser parte de la comunidad y familia de Kendo. Los estudiantes de Kendo son entusiasmados y están sobre, eh, sumamente contentos con las oportunidades que brinda la escuela. Sobre todo, eso es la evidencia que yo noté en lo que es el nuevo show que es corrido por los niños, que se llama Kids Talk. Es un episodio donde ustedes pueden ver y, serlo, y ver con sus propios ojos lo brillante que son ellos. En un episodio reciente, los niños pudieron identificar cuál era la mejor conexión a lo que es la comunidad de Kendo y por qué las tres iniciativas, lo que llamamos Family Style Lunch, que es comiendo como estilo de familia, donde los niños van a permanecer comiendo lunch con un adulto y con lo que es otro niño. También tenemos el programa de Ruler, que es dirigido por lo que es una iniciativa de un programa dirigido por Yeo, que es, eh, se dedica a demostrar y crear las emociones y la inteligencia de cada niño. También tenemos los programas de clusters que son para que los niños identifiquen sus pasiones personales y sus intereses. Como alguien que profesionalmente fue entrenada con el programa en Yale de Ruler, yo sé que eso es algo positivo porque yo mismo lo vi en mi propia escuela, donde los niños tienen sus propias oportunidades y las herramientas para expresarse emocionalmente. Yo veo mucho valor en este programa en que los niños lo tengan en la escuela de Kendo. Creo que eso le va a aumentar su inteligencia y le crea un lugar a salvo donde los niños pueden tomar cosas de la academia con más frecuencia 
y también armar las, las clases y tener más confianza en sí mismo. Las iniciativas que Kendo le brinda a los estudiantes son importantes porque son los mejores programas con gentes que realmente le importa. En lo que vamos cogiendo las experiencias a lo que es la, el camino a la universidad, los niños son balanceados con un almanaque que va a ir a su favor. Como una miembra y padre que soy la, la, la eh, silla y abocante de mi hijo, yo me siento totalmente orgullosa y yo también apoyo a que tengan el almanaque balanceado. Con la iniciativa sobre la barra, evidencia lo ha mostrado y tengo información que muestra que teniendo un almanaque balanceado va a reducir los bajos que pasan durante las vacaciones de verano donde muchos de los estudiantes pierden lo que han aprendido académicamente y ellos formalmente pierden alguna de las cosas por las vacaciones extendidas de ocho semanas en el semana. Yo lo sé por mi hijo y por los otros niños que yo no puedo tomar esos pasos para atrás. Y yo no puedo permitir que ningún otro niño pierda la oportunidad de leer mejor, tener mejor lectura y que se le pasen alguna práctica de las matemáticas. Mi familia y yo estamos dispuestos de cambiar nuestros planes de, la, de los veranos, si es necesario, recambiar el, el, el uh, cuidado del de niño y lo más importante también yo mantenerme a lo que es toda la meta de lo, de lo que pide el calendario para yo brindarle a mi hijo y a la comunidad de Kendo lo que ellos necesitan. Sin haber a duda, no tengo miedo en decir que los detalles y el dinero no son cosas que todavía no lo sabemos, pero cuando vemos la foto grande es clara la visión. Los estudiantes lo merecen y yo, y, y yo pienso que la comunidad de Kendo es una que se tiene que apoyar y que traigan las metas y los sueños a la vida y que eso se pueda alcanzar. Solo significa que nosotros tomemos algo fuera de lo normal y que vayamos en contra de algo que realmente era la escuela tradicional. Yo pienso que lo podemos hacer, pensar fuera de la caja. Gracias. So the next person I'm going to call up is Mary Jordan. And in an effort to be fair to those that went before uh, Miss Hennessy and those that will go afterwards, I was going to keep it three minutes. So when the timer goes off, I'll, that'll be the three-minute warning. Six minutes total, to be clear, um, just to, in effort to balance it out. So you, get, you can have double, unless we're still translating. I'll try to yes, be brief. No, right? I appreciate mm -hmm. that. Are we still translating? Okay. Definitely. Got it. Mary Jordan, Nine Mod Avenue, uh, Norwalk. Good evening. Uh, I represent the NFT. All the members in the NFT in every circumstance, in every building, are committed to excellent practice to serve our students very well, whether we are in our first year of teaching or in our 30th. There are proposals in this next budget year that are more disruptive of the personal and professional lives of the certified staff than previously experienced. Uh, and we have detailed that in many presentations over the past year. As you're considering the budget, we ask that you prioritize items that will help provide uh, small class sizes, direct classroom instruction that's high quality, um, and provide resources to our students for instruction. The initiatives this year that I'm referring to that are disruptive of our staff, some members of our staff are highly appreciative of, but many are complaining that these would include the March break, the high school start times, and the alternative calendar at Kendall. I understand that the board is committed to these. I understand that each one has enormous potential. But I want to share this teacher perspective. There are good employees who have begun leaving their buildings. They have begun leaving the district to seek employment where they can find a better life-work balance to sustain what they wish to be a long and satisfying but very demanding career. This evening, you are considering approval of the high school of the Kendall alternate calendar. This is an innovation, an experiment. It is intended to provide a high need school with extra elements to improve outcomes. The district and the NFT all agree that all of our students deserve excellent opportunities. 
we would like to point out that the actions so far taken have led to possibly unintended consequences. At Kendall, there are still large class sizes. There are still large numbers of an increasing number of inexperienced staff. Research is clear about the importance of experienced staff, smaller class sizes, and we would want to encourage relationships between the colleagues in a building and between those families that they serve, as well as the students. The turnover of staff members over the summer and that continues during the school year have meant that the whole school trainings in PSYOP and trauma-informed instruction are a historical reality. Currently serving the building are not full schools of PSYOP trained instructors. The situation is quite complex. There will continue to be certified staff who seek to leave the building. Some will stay. All are committed to the needs of every student. There are many ways to achieve this end. Thank you for your attention. Are we going to continue with the translation? <coughs> or no? No? They're watching. Definitely. <coughs> Definitely should translate. Yes. I mean, it seems. Like yeah. it would make sense if we started that way that we should continue, no? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. The families, but maybe for sure. Can we do that? Also, are you able to do that spontaneously? <laughs> okay. You're awesome. Thank you. It's much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no problem. You can ignore the scribbled parts and just Buenas noches, miembros de la junta. Todos los miembros de la NFT y bajo las circunstancias que estamos cometidos a la práctica de excelencia para poder servir a cada estudiante en la mejoría del de primer año como maestro. Yo estoy proponiendo que en otros de las metas del de próximo año no sean complicadas con algunas de las agendas personales y profesionales de algunas de la vida de miembros que han podido sobrepasar lo que ha sucedido. Con detalle, yo traigo la presentación de lo siguiente. Eso incluye teniendo tiempos fuera en el mes de marzo, teniendo la escuela eh, secundarias que comiencen en otro tiempo y que haya un almanaque alternativo incluyendo en ese que tiene Kendo. Yo entiendo que la Junta está cometido para, para estas cosas, pero quiero brindar como una profesora esta perspectiva. No es un buen ejemplo para los empleados que comiencen a irse de los edificios o que dejen el distrito para buscar empleo en otro lugar a donde pueden encontrar un mejor, una mejor vida de balance que pueda sostener los deseos en contener ello satisfacer en su carrera. Esta noche yo quiero que ustedes consideran aprobar otra cosa de alternativa al almanaque que ha presentado Kendo. Y sé que es solamente un experimento innovativo que va con su intención a proveer necesidades a, a los niños, pero en otra cosa elementar algún tipo de logros. Yo deseo que el distrito y el NFT los dos queden de acuerdo con los estudiantes que ellos merecen mejores oportunidades. Yo deseo también a señalar que algunas de las acciones se han llevado muy lejos y deben de aumentar en algunos de los logros para que tengan los niños una mejoría. En la escuela de Kendo hay muchas clases grandes y hay un sinnúmero de profesoras que son sin experiencia. Nosotros hemos notado que la importancia de tener a alguien trabajando con experiencia en clases más pequeñas tiene más fruto. Tenemos 14 personas de miembros sobre el verano que han dejado de trabajar en el lugar y también durante el año escolar. Eso significa que no hay entrenamiento en algunos de los programas como el de SIA y el programa de trama informado en intrusión para presentarles a las personas que se han ido del edificio. Con más gente llegando nuevo y con el medio de lo que es la mitad del de edificio, no es necesario tener el entrenamiento. 
Yo creo que si ese es el caso de que tengan un edificio completo entrenado, la situación se hace más compleja. Deberemos de continuar de, de mantener a los profesores que están certificados, que quieren lograr de ir a, a otro edificio si tienen un almanaque, si no hay ningún tipo de problema. Yo estoy cometido a los bienes de todos los estudiantes y quiero también a lograr eso como pueda, en el fin. Kelly Dominic. So I'm not as tall as him and I won't sound as nice. <laughs> so good evening, Chairperson Lemieux, members of the Board of Ed, Dr. Adam Askey. My name is Kelly Dominic, and I am not only a product of the Nora Public Schools, but a proud 15-year veteran at Kendall Elementary School. The subject of one of your action items on the agenda this evening. I'm here this evening as a Norwalk Federation of Teachers building steward to share information that is timely, relevant, and requires your attention. While I am nervous to speak publicly, I feel it is my responsibility to do so. On May 21, 2019, two Kendall NFT stewards presented information on the, to the board concerning several issues about the bar, of the bar grant, including staff buy-in, as well as the unfair and collateral damage type consequences to the students of Kendall due to this project. In that presentation, it was brought to your attention that Kendall has not been the lowest performing school as of late, a factor that continues to be used as justification for the project. This has been evidenced as recently as 2018 in which Kendall had one of the highest next generation accountability index scores in the entire district. That achievement resulted in Kendall being recognized for being in the top 10% for growth in the state of Connecticut and ELA hardly a feat attained by a school with poor performance. If one was so inclined, they could retrace CMT, NWEA, and SBAC data to see. Additionally, last May, the NFT stewards brought your, to your attention that, that almost two thirds of the staff, certified staff, would be looking to transfer if the balance calendar was enacted. The majority of the concerns came because of financial and ch childcare hardships. Teaching is a profession that people often pursue, not only because of a passion, but also because it is family friendly. As many women will go on to become mothers, it, becomes sense, it makes sense that nine out of 10 teachers in primary grades are female, a job that lends itself to being home with, when the children are home. As of today's date, 22 teachers from last year's staff are no longer at Kendall, including the gym, art, music, gifted and talented, 25% of grade five, 50% of grades one and three, and the special ed team, 66% of the ELL team, and 75% of grades two and four. There are still several teachers that asked to transfer last year that didn't get a new assignment, as was promised by the superintendent in several speeches. I'm here to report that in addition to the teachers from last year, there are now additional staff that have indicated to me that they too are seeking an assignment transfer this year from Kendall due to the hardship of the calendar. Kendall has gone from one of the most experienced staffs in all of Norwalk to one of the most inexperienced. If this calendar takes effect, it seems Kendall will become a revolving door for entry level teachers looking to get experience, not a place to close the achievement gap. Calendars don't teach students, teachers do. Thank you. Buenas noches, Junta. Yo soy la profesora Kelly Dabanek y soy un producto del pueblo de Novo. Soy una veterana de 15 años como profesora en Kendo y es uno de los temas de acción que quería discutir esta noche. Nosotros estamos aquí esta noche con la Junta de la Federación de Maestros para tratar de brindar información que es a tiempo y relevante a lo que se requiere su atención. Si me noto una, un poco nerviosa es porque yo realmente no hablo públicamente, pero me siento responsable de hacerlo. El 21 de marzo de 2019, dos profesoras que eran parte de la NFT se presentaron con información a la Junta para discutir algunos temas 
que era sobre la barra. La beca que tenía que tener algún tipo de relación con los empleados entrando en ella, que realmente me sentí injusta y que no se pudo arreglar por tipo de consecuencia con los estudiantes debido al proyecto de Kendo en el momento. En esa presentación, yo quería traer en la, en, a su atención que la escuela de Kendo no ha podido demostrar que era la, la mejor o digo la menos baja en el tiempo. A factorar es algo que siguen continuando de tratar de justificar con este proyecto. Es evidencia que desde el 2018 la escuela de Kendo es una de las más altas de la nueva generación y esas son algunos números que se discuten en el distrito completo. Los logros y alcances fueron un resultado de la escuela de Kendo y deben de ser reconocida por unas del, sobre el 10% de alcance en el estado de Connecticut. Adicionalmente, al fin de mayo, el NFT compró y trajo atención a casi dos terceras partes de lo que eran eh, personas certificadas que dejaron de trabajar en Kendo solo por el calendario balanceado. La mayoría de esos fue porque ellos no podían encontrar cuidado y se encontraron finan eh, financieramente eh, atapados con el calendario balanceado. Ser maestra es una profesión que muchos quieren hacer no solo por la pasión, pero también porque es ayudante a las familias. Como muchas de las mujeres pueden ver, yo como madre, vamos a tomar en cuenta que nueve de las diez maestras en escuela primaria de grado son femeninas. Un trabajo que presta que cada persona tenga tiempo de pasarse tiempo con sus propios hijos en su casa. Hasta la fecha, 22 de los maestros del, del año pasado ya no trabajan en Kendo, incluyendo el profesor de Ignacia, Arte, Música y de Talento. Nosotros vimos un 25% del grado 5, 50% del grado 1 y 3 de lo que eran Educación Especial no trabajar allá, incluyendo 66% del de equipo de inglés como segundo idioma. 75% del grado 2 y 4 y todavía hay, un, hay unos cuantos que han pedido transferir desde el año pasado y no han podido encontrar un lugar nuevo que fue prometido por el superintendente. Yo estoy aquí para reportar en adición que los maestros del año pasado hay muchos que están buscando que me han indicado que también quieren pedir trasladarse. Nosotros encontramos que el almanaque de eh, balanceado no trae problema, pero que también la escuela ha, ha sacado muchos de, lo, de, de los empleados con más experiencia fuera del distrito de Norwalk para personas con poca experiencia. Si el calendario coge efecto, se ve como que la escuela de Kendo puede volar como una escuela de maestros de primera experiencia buscando trabajo, no como una escuela que quiere cerrar lo que es el logro académico. Por favor, no háganos estos, enseñemos los niños que los profesores también pueden. Deborah Butler. Hi, I'm Debbie Butler, live in Norwalk. Um, I was supposed to be Kelly's backup in case she didn't finish, but she finished, so I get a chance to talk, so I'm going to talk to you. Um, I'm a 34-year teacher in Norwalk. 22 of them have been at Kendall. I'm very proud of our, our kids. You did a great job, guys. Two of them I have a personal stake in. The other lovely young lady, you did a great job. I've seen you around school. Um, I just wanted to just to say to you, a lot of great things have been going on at Kendall. Um, family style lunch. <coughs> Um, I, I don't like to talk in public. Um, I kind of got elected to do this. Yeah, it's not the greatest thing. Family style lunch, the enrichment clusters. Um, but there's so much more to above the bar than just that. And my concern after 34 years of teaching is smaller class sizes, quality, para support in the room, special ed support, and um, 
when you just consider this, and I, I'm not against uh, the balanced calendar. I'm an old lady. My kids have gone through the Norwalk Public Schools. Of very four kids, very successful. They've done great. I can work. 24-7 if I had to, so it has nothing to do with my personal schedule. It has to do with the kids, and I'm advocating for the kids. Please just know smaller class sizes, para support, quality para support is a real important thing, and I have not seen that in Above the Bar. So maybe when you're considering, we can put some of that in too. Thank you for your time, and this is a first. <laughs> have a good night. Buenas noches, soy la profesora Debbie Butler, soy una veterana de 34 años que ha permitido 24 dando enseñanza en la escuela de Kendo. Estoy muy orgulloso de los niños que han presentado esta noche mucho. Dos de ellos han pasado por mí y uno de ellos siempre la veo por la escuela. Estoy muy orgulloso de ella. Quería brindarle que mucho lo que se trae sobre la meta, sobre el calendario, <coughs> Es algo que yo he visto en la escuela, no algo como tan positivo como lo quieren poner. Hay muchas cosas que la escuela trae que realmente me apena porque quiero mucho a mi, a mi pueblo, pero también quiero mucho a mi escuela. Encuentro que las clases tan grandes traen complicaciones para todos los estudiantes. Necesito más apoyo como profesora en clases más pequeñas para que tengan enseñanza y que si van a alcanzar algo sobre la barra, que sea con la ayuda de una para profesional a cada momento, que tenga experiencia, que se dedique a los niños y que se dedique a lo que es la meta de la escuela. Es importante porque para mí personalmente soy una viejita y a mí ya no me hace, tengo mis cuatro niños, toditos son talentosos y ya se han graduado. Realmente para mí no me hace trabajar las 24 horas. Pero sí lo digo que si van a hacer cualquier cambio que tomen en cuenta que sea algo que sea para los niños donde se puedan concentrar en la educación primero. Gracias. I'd like to call Joe, Mr. I just call Mr. G. Just to see myself. Good evening. Uh, good evening, members of the Board of Education. Um, my name is Joseph Chandurko, um, Vice President of the Teachers Union. I'm here tonight as we take an important step to move forward the plans and ed specs for the new Norwalk High. The current conditions of Norwalk High, like many of our buildings, are deplorable. Mold, air, poor air conditions, electrical wiring, and other failing systems have plagued this building <laughs> and many others throughout the district. Proper maintenance and planning is required. We must re-examine our current plans and standards to ensure our buildings do not fall into such disrepair that the only solution is the construction of a new facility. At this point, though, I do believe that exercising some form of measured caution is the best course of action. Norwalk must pause for a moment and reprioritize our building projects even as we proceed with the Norwalk High project. The Ely project is delayed and will delay the renovations of Columbus. If we take this opportunity to take a step back and reevaluate our needs and the available space throughout the district, I believe we will be in a better position for our students and our community. If we move with caution and better foresight, our remaining projects can be brought back on track and completed, aiding students and staff as they were originally intended to do. It, is, it will be impossible to create more space for our students and to begin, I'm sorry, it will be possible to create more space for our students and begin to ease the overcapacity issues we see arising throughout the district. As we have most recently seen with the Ponus project, poor planning and limited stakeholder input has led to an undersized building with the afterthought of furniture. Even with the construction, there will still be a need for portables to house all the students. It should also be noted that the renovated upper school will remain undersized and may force some electives onto a cart. Tonight, take this opportunity to move the Norwalk High project forward for the benefit of our students, staff, and Norwalk. Think carefully about the impact of a Visual Performing Arts Academy so that there is no negative impact on our fine arts education programs that currently exist. And also, take the time to look at the grandeur of Dr. Adamowski's building plans and realize that we must look at the projects in their totality and possibly adjust timelines to ensure that these projects are done properly and done with respect for the cities and taxpayers' ability to support our educational system. Thank you.
Buenas noches, Junta de la Educación. Quiero traer esta noche un punto muy importante. Mi nombre es Mr. G. Y quiero de discutir algunos de los planes específicamente con las iniciativas nuevas en la Escuela Secundaria de Novo. Quería hablar de las condiciones de la escuela porque muchos de los, de los edificios tienen muchas condiciones pobres, donde no se ve la electricidad, se ve algo del de sistema plagueado y el edificio tiene muchas incorrecciones en el distrito. Se requiere que tenga mantenimiento apropiado y que eh, la planificación que sea requerida. Yo quiero que se reexamine algunos de los planes que yo discutí que sean los estándares para yo asegurarme que el edificio no vaya a ir en decadencia en repare para una solución de construcción para una facilidad nueva. En este punto yo creo que es importante que nosotros podamos organizar unas metas que sean alcanzables para el mejor discurso de acción. El nuevo quería tomar pasa por un momento para poder poner en prioridad que algunos de los proyectos del edificio sean procedidos como el proyecto de la escuela NHS y ese proyecto. El proyecto ELI es uno que ha durado mucho y se ha demorado en renovaciones en Colombia. Si nosotros tenemos y cogemos un paso hacia atrás, podemos mirar un momento para reevaluar las la necesidades y analizar el espacio disponible para el distrito que yo creo sería una mejor posición para nuestros estudiantes y nuestra comunidad. Si podemos mover con algún tipo de precaución y no olvidar lo necesario, los proyectos que quedan serían traídos de una manera completada y eso se puede ejercer con la ayuda de los estudiantes y los miembros del equipo que trabajan. Originalmente es importante para ello. Si todo es posible y puedo crear más espacio para los estudiantes, creo que se puede sobrellevar la sobrecapacidad de algunos de los problemas que se están notando en el distrito ahora. Fue muy reciente que yo noté en el programa de Pones que fue un proyecto muy mal organizado y que fue limitado de aquellos que tuvieron el alcance en un edificio de, tan poco, eh, de, de bajo tamaño. Y, y si pienso en la fornitura y todo lo otro, vi el edificio poco agarre. Incluso eh, la construcción que fue atraído fue portable por la casa de los estudiantes. Debe de ser notado que la renovación de las escuelas primarias, eh, secundarias, se permanezcan bajo tamaño y que no le traigan más enforzar electivos a traer un solo carro. Esta noche le traigo esta oportunidad para tratar de mover del proyecto de No Walk High hacia adelante como un beneficio para los estudiantes, los empleados de Novo. Piensen con cuidado el impacto y la visualidad de cómo la Academia de los Artes puede ser impactada de una manera negativa si no ayudamos los programas de educación. Solo tomen un momento para ver el grandor del de doctor Aromaski en algunos de los planes que ha realizado y podemos ver que la totalidad es posible si algunos de los programas se notan con el tiempo necesario para asegurar que los proyectos se hagan apropiadamente, con respeto y de la ciudad, que aquellos que pagan impuestos tengan la habilidad de sostener el sistema educativo. Lac Lara, did I pronounce it correctly? Lac. Lac. Oh, Zach, is it a Zach? Did I pronounce it correctly? <laughs> Sorry. Chair, in the interest of all the children and teachers who have early starts in the morning, could we maybe just translate the comments that pertain to Kendall? I'm not sure. Okay. Since we started doing it, I think we might have to finish that way in the interests of uh, parity. Like, parity. Okay. That's my thought. Mm -hmm. So. 
So dad is gonna go Spanish and I'm gonna translate English? Great. Buenas noches, Departamento de Educación de Nowhere. Mi nombre es Zacarias Lara. Soy el papá de Samira. Uh, solo quería agradecerle a todo el equipo de Kendall School por el increíble trabajo que, que hacen con los niños cuando llegan de otra escuela y cuando llegan de otros países. Mi hija se ha beneficiado muchísimo de eso y yo como padre estoy sumamente orgulloso. Eh, es increíble como el equipo entero siempre sonríe cuando encuentra uno en el pasillo, cuando va a la escuela por cualquier necesidad, con la gratitud y amabilidad que no tratan a los residentes de Nowell. No es solo el caso de mi hija porque soy un pequeño comerciante de la ciudad de Nowell por 10 años y tengo la oportunidad de hablar con los clientes, estudiantes y padres que van a mi negocio a menudo y eso me permite saber el trato que ellos reciben eh, de la administración de la escuela de Kendall donde estudia mi hija. Y fue lo que me motivó a inscribirla en la escuela hace dos años. Y ha sido la mejor experiencia que he tenido como padre en la escuela con mi hija. Muchas gracias. Especialmente a Miss Baker, a um, Miss Crossman, a Mr. BJ. Son un equipo extraordinario. Muchas gracias y buenas noches. Thank you. Gracias. Good evening. My name is Zachariah. I am a parent of Zamira, who presented here tonight from Kendall. I wanted to say hello to the Board of Education tonight, and I also wanted to extend my applause to the School of Kendall for the job that they've been able to do, not only with my daughter, but the other students who do attend the school. As a small businessman in Connecticut, I can tell you hands-on that I know firsthand that other students and parents who do visit my establishment have shared with me the greatness that they have seen in this school, from staff, the administration, and the people who go there. Friendly staff in the hallways, always smiling, and people always extending a nice hand at all given points. I love the way that they have supported <laughs> incoming families for myself and other immigrant families who have came in. This is my second year, and I've never taken a better decision than enrolling my daughter in this school. I'm very proud of the school, thanks to Ms. Baker, to Ms. Grossman, staff, of everything that they do. Thank you, and I wish that Kendall continues to, to, to do great things. Thank you. I'd like to call Brenda Penn Williams. No, oh, okay. Cla Claudette Ludwig. Good evening, Board, Board of Education, Norwalk Board of Education. My name is Claudette Cabrera Ludwig. I'm a proud resident of Norwalk for 14 years. I stand here as a parent of a new uh, Norwalk public educated student. My daughter began this journey nine years ago, her education journey. Uh, last year, we were needing to help make sure that her education needs were being met. So we made the choice to join the public education system in Norwalk. And after seeing the amazing transitions and um, all the investment and all the good work that the boards have, have done over the years that I've lived here, um, we, we really were excited about being able to do this. Um, it was a choice for us. And like many of the parents you heard tonight, it was, it's been a choice for them. And I did probably a very unorthodox approach. I actually studied the um, school improvement plans um, of every school in Norwalk before I made this decision. And uh, the one that just, just resonated with me um, and was a highlight and was something I was super excited about was the Above the Bar Grant um, program at Kendall Elementary School. It was highlighted in the school improvement plan. Again, I read it there and I couldn't help but really needing to, and, 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 we, and it is in our, our district, it's our, our neighborhood. Um, so it even made us more proud that we could um, be a part of it. 
Uh, I bear witness to all the amazing things that have been talked about today through the parents and the teachers. And um, my daughter is in fourth grade, but through this Bud the Bar grant, what we're excited about is, you know, we don't want her, her to experience a summer slide. We want to, and which I think is a really great point for any elementary school potentially, is to not have that summer slide for middle school. You know, we, we want her to be ready, feel confident when she gets into that and, and starts her, her, her new educational journey in middle school. So I feel it is um, the work that everyone's done and will continue to do and should you know is is something that we're very proud of and that today that as you approve the balanced <laughs> calendar you will continue to see more and uh, hear more um, I don't consider this as an experiment I consider this as a solution that fosters the innovation that's needed in education today and that we know that our children deserve in especially the children of Norwalk and the children of Kendall are already um, beginning that journey. So thank you, to, and I look forward to um, hearing your approval of this balanced calendar. Buenas noches. Ella es la madre, la señora Ludwig. Es la madre de una estudiante del cuatro año en la escuela de Kendall. Ella quería dejarle saber que antes de ella tomar la decisión de entrar en escuela pública, Encontró de que durante el tiempo la niña estaba en una escuela que no era apropiada y tomaron el chance de ejercer en una escuela pública. En tratando de ejercer eso, encontró que muchas de las cosas que tuvo que estudiar hizo algo que fue un poquito diferente, donde estudió todas las escuelas públicas, pero estaba tratando de estudiar lo que era importante en el cambio del index que es el número del el por ciento de los niños enrolados y cómo van mejorando. Encontré eso ser una manera de ver que la escuela de Kendo es dedicada para traerlo. Yo también como las otras que han presentado no fue que cogí la escuela por mi propio gusto. La cogí porque era una necesidad pero después de estar ahí estoy muy orgullosa de lo que han hecho. El calendario sobre del año es algo donde yo lo he mirado como algo positivo porque encuentro que durante los veranos los niños van en decadencia por la falta de educación en esas semanas. Yo voy en contra de alguien que piense lo contrario. Encuentro que si hay mejoría en una escuela es porque se han dedicado a hacer las cosas que han tratado. Yo soy parte de la Junta de Padres y también he tomado el tiempo en notar que la decisión de estar en una escuela como Kendo fue lo mejor que yo hice para mí, mi hija y la familia. Diane Loricella. Loricella. Sorry about that. Good evening. Uh, for tonight's agenda, there are many really terrific things here, but I wanted to focus on two things, basically. The 2020-21 budget, but mainly skipping down to action steps related to number three, approval of education or ed specs of new Norwalk High School, p -Tech Academy, Arts Academy. Um, I've been told to wait, wait another year. We're in the process of looking at a very tough uh, budget. And because of that, I think it behooves this uh, board to try to find savings and revenues wherever possible. And I've been in front of you several times over the years, but because of <coughs> what I read in your ed specs, I think that the need has to happen where this goes back to the drawing board. Now the ed specs were presented at the end of a long meeting of, after the finance committee last week and uh, as a facilities committee agenda item and there was no public comment at the time. I had time to read it and take a look 
because many of you might know that I am one that feels that this board can do a lot more in any of its renovation and new construction projects related to including renewable energy as a way of offsetting your electrical costs so that that money, that savings, can be reinvested into many of the programs that many of the parents and teachers and you feel are important. There's been, a, I will say uh, kindly, an anemic effort to incur, include solar on schools besides your roofs, ca car canopies, and also ground mounted. And there are a lot of other ways to do it. But going back to actually your, I would say, look at page four of the ed specs for the educational specs. Uh, page five talks about HVAC, electrical and plumbing, and technology. This is not embracing 21st century renewable energy to offset many of the issues here. Now, I don't have time today to go into all the details why I feel that the people that have prepared this for you, one, of who's, one or two who are sitting behind me, I don't think that they have looked outside the box. They've not consulted other states and other districts in our state that have already realized um, we're talking not $10,000, we're talking about millions of dollars over time because they're using solar power or they're using a lot more of passive solar. Is that I know you're, I would ask that you give me another minute to wrap up since others have. 30 more seconds, please. Well, I'm sorry, you've allowed other people to speak over six minutes, and this is important for today's. So I, will, I would like to wrap it up, please. Not more three more seconds, but one more minute, if that would be OK. Because I've sat and waited for other people to speak. And so what I have to please, say yes. is important. Thank you. If you skip down to page 48, 49, where you talk about the dining hall, your staff dining, your kitchen, there is absolutely no mention in the ed specs about recycling, food recovery. That is part of ed specs in other school districts. There are no containers, no textile recovery. These are things that are costing this district unneeded, wasteful money in trash hauling costs. I've been told in the past that 100000 even cutting it in half or having a goal of cutting in half your trash hauling costs is too small of an amount to bother with it. Well, that is irresponsible. And so I'm asking today that this list, lastly on page 51 in building services, it talks about mechanical and electrical units. It gives only 100 square feet, feet to keep in recycling toters. Again, there is no mention of recycling containers in areas where you accumulate materials that can be pulled out of your trash. It's called diversion. And um, because the professionals that have given you these ed specs continue to do this year after year, I ask that you send this back to committee, the facilities committee. I will make a point of making sure the chairperson, uh, Ms. Sarah, takes a look in advance as to why these ed specs are not good enough on some of the issues that I think will save you a lot of money. Thank, Thank you, you, Diane. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. That concludes public comments or no? Oh, okay. Just a, a summary of a summary. Yeah. El resumen de la señora Diane es que ella quiere que no esperen más reservando los fondos para que puedan asistir lo que es la energía solar. Ella encuentra que en varias de las páginas de la agenda, principalmente la 4 y la 5, mencionan en algunas de las espe la especificaciones de educación y tecnología que es necesario que guarden el dinero para que lo puedan invertir en diferentes cosas para consultar. Ella tiene en varias páginas, la 48 y la 49, donde ella habla del programa de el reciclaje, donde se gasta mucho dinero y que también tienen manera de cómo mejorar si invierten en programas que puedan reciclar y que gasten el dinero en diversión, que es para cambiar y invertir en energía solar. Más pendiente. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for all of the translating work that you did this evening also. 
Okay, that concludes public comment, and now we will move to item five, which is the superintendent's report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, um, got three um, important items tonight. Uh, the first, uh, the board has heard from time to time about our efforts to move from a punitive disciplinary system to uh, a set of restorative practices. And this has been designed around um, uh, reducing uh, the rate of suspension and expulsion of our students. And um, I think at our last report, um, you saw that um, we were meeting with success in, in reducing suspensions and expulsions uh, because of this. Well, we've taken another big step forward um, in, the, in this uh, past year and um, with, the, uh, with the effort of uh, the individuals who you're going to meet uh, tonight. And uh, we thought it was uh, important that you know about this and that they be recognized for their efforts. So Dr. Costanzo, if you would, uh, you would lead us off. Thanks, Dr. Adamowski. Good evening, board members. Um, so this is an update on our work around restorative practices in the Nora Public Schools. Uh, as many of you may know, close to two years ago, I met with Lashante James, AP at Roten Middle School, Ed Singleton, uh, Norwalk High School AP, and Barbara Wood, who is an assistant principal at Brian McMahon High School, having uh, been given the charge to rewrite the district's behavioral code of conduct, student code of conduct. Uh, and in the process of our researching exemplar public school district code of conducts, we uh, quickly learned that restorative approaches to school discipline incidents had been consistently integrated uh, into their systems. Meriden was one school system, uh, New Haven another. We found that districts that had made this shift were experiencing more positive school culture and reduced rates of suspension and expulsion. Our eventual NPS code of conduct made its debut at the start of the 2018-2019 school year, reflecting much of what we had come to learn and understand about this emerging social science around restorative work in schools. The manual was designed to give administrators more flexibility in methods for responding to disciplinary offenses at their schools. More importantly, however, than the manual itself was our desire to build a district-wide vision around restorative practices, or in layperson's terms, how the district might reimagine the ways in which adults and students interact with one another, how they form and sustain trusting relationships, and how this could help to reshape student perceptions about their own ability to influence their school's culture. Now, after having Dr. Joanne Freiberg, who is an education consultant with the Connecticut State Department of Education, come down to Norwalk on a number of occasions, including meeting with our school leaders um, at, for restorative practices introductory session, we realized that scaling and sustaining this effort would only really be realized if the people who led the effort believed in it themselves. And so we found 12 NPS staff, including teachers, a dean of students, a counselor, and administrators who are devoted to trying to do our work differently. Last summer, they began that effort to be certified to, provo to provide restorative practices training to their colleagues throughout the district. And one week of training occurred in Evanston, Illinois, followed by three full days of training back home here in Norwalk. And so I want to give a shout out to each of them individually, and then I'll ask that they come up and provide a bit more detail on the work that's occurred up until this point and what we are projecting um, uh, to do in the months and the years ahead in Norwalk. So in this uh, really wonderful group of educators, Lashante James, Roten Middle School. Uh, Ed, Ed Singleton, Norwalk High School. Barbara you, Wood, could you come up Ryan to where McMahon. the board can see you? Could you come up to where the board can come, see you come up a little bit across this way, please. You. Unfortunately, James Crouch, uh, principal at uh, Brookside, could not be here tonight, but he is a uh, representative of, at the elementary level. Deborah Bell Johnson, Columbus assistant principal. Ellen Knapp, Dean of Students, Ponus Middle School. 
Heather Makura, Nathan Hale Middle School, Jason Zakar, Roten Middle School, Lewis Jackson, West Rocks, Lewis Sheedy, Norwalk High School, Paola Perez, Brian McMahon, and Robin Denke, Norwalk High School. So, with this internal expertise having been developed, uh, we intend to offer a two-day professional development series, Intro to Restorative Practices and Circles, this summer and throughout next school year. And so we will be reaching out to uh, Norwalk Public Schools certified and non-certified staff to take part in this two-day, 16-hour training. Uh, so we are very excited about this, and the people with the details and the ability to, to pull this work off at the schools are standing behind me. So I will ask Barbara to start, say a few words, and you will hear from some, not all, of this excellent group of educators. Thank you. Uh, just, I'd like to, on behalf of our group, um, thank the board for the support for this uh, training. It really has, I think, when I speak for all of us, really been uh, very transformative in, in terms of how we are approaching our work. And we are really excited to be able to train the rest of the staff as we move forward with this initiative. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, and I know we presented um, last school year, but really when we talk about restorative practices, it is um, a focus on relationships. Most of the work is proactive. It's building relationships with kids. And there's a real emphasis on focusing on the harm done rather than on the rule breaking and a focus on how we bring our kids back into the community when something bad has happened. Um, and so it's really, goes back to indigenous populations when when there's a problem in the community you come together as a community and you talk about ways to to work together as a community to build a really positive um, school environment um, it empowers change and growth because one of the things that's um, really changed how we all work is is not so much the consequence but what can we learn and how can we work together to, to improve behavior, and we've really seen some positive results. I know last year we um, brought students who had conflict to a board meeting, and they talked about the experience, and we've continued to do that, and we're really uh, excited about the results we're seeing. Um, we find that with a focus on restorative practices, students become more engaged and participate more in problem solving, we use a series of questions and we talk about not not about why did you do this, but what happened, you know, what can we do differently, who was harmed by the actions, and what do we do need to do to make things right? That being the key question, like how do we get back to being a, a community? Um, and the other piece that I think is really important is when we look at the the code of conduct in a restorative way, there are a range of options to address behavior. So the, the least important thing sometimes is going to be the punishment, but what are we doing with that? And that's really the key. And our goal is to keep the small things small. Uh, we want to keep kids in school. We have uh, an understanding that the most significant harm can be done to a child who we have to put who's not attending school. So our goal is always to keep kids in school. And 80% of the work we do in restorative is always proactive. It starts in the classroom with the teachers working in the circles and that's been really powerful for the people that uh, have implemented that. Ed? Thank you. Good evening. So I'm looking at the uh, restorative practices con con continuum and as you see there are five continuums that we look at and it goes from the less time and less impactful to, the, to more time and the most impactful. So th the first part is the effective statement. And as I'm looking at effective statements, they're usually called I statements, things that when you want to put yourself involved into the person who has maybe offended you or keeping it more positive, what we're going to look at today, I'm going to try to give you an I statement like to the board. So I'm going to say, I feel, I'm sorry, I feel very appreciated when you 
entrust this group um, because now we can now take all of our knowledge and impart this on the public uh, Nora Public Schools. Mm -hmm. So that's an I statement. Sometimes we have to deal with I statements in a negative part, but it ne doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to use it in a negative realm, okay? So that's an effective statement. And then we have restorative um, questions. Our restorative questions are very scripted. IIRP actually imparted with us um, before we left a card and you can actually purchase them. And my principal has um, actually given us the opportunity to give those out to our, our, our staff members. Um, so the, uh, the restorative questions starts off with what happened as opposed to why. When you ask someone why, that be becomes a very emotional tool sometimes and people bring in all types of emotions of how they felt as opposed to telling the story. So what they ask us to, to ask our, our, when you're in a restorative circle, they'll, they'll ask us what happened. The second thing that you want to ask is, what were you thinking about at the time? The next thing, after you've c conveyed all of that, what have you brought, uh, what have you thought about since? <coughs> and who has been affected by what you have done? And these questions are to the offender. What have you, uh, what do you do to think what you need to do to make things right? Mm -hmm. So these are very thoughtful questions as opposed to, when, you know, sometimes as an administrator, when I'm dealing with kids in conflict, I'll ask them, well, why did you do that? That's a very hard question to ask. And that's a very hard question for a student and sometimes a staff member to receive because it there imparts a lots of emotion on that. Okay, so there's another side of the card. So after you finish that part, you go to the second part. What did you think when you realized what, you had, ha what had happened? So that's a, a question that now we've gotten through what happened and how we've arrived at the situation. Now it's being very reflective. And so more, some more of the reflective um, um, questions are, what impact has this incident had on you and has it had on others? Mm -hmm. What has been the hardest thing for you? So now this gives the offender the opportunity to, to talk about how they felt and what led them to do what they did. And the last question that I think is really important is, what do you think needs to happen to make things right? And that's the most restorative part of the, of the whole conference. After you've, you've gotten to um, discuss how we arrived here, now how do I make this right at the end? How do I move on from what I acknowledged was wrong, and how do I move on from that? Okay? So small impromptu conversations, I actually have a very... Um, close relationship with Ms. Dinky. Uh, she's the senior class uh, counselor for 12th grade students at Norwalk High School. She's a majority of the students. And we actually now are at a point in time where we're starting to talk about graduation. We're talking about um, your future beyond Norwalk High School. So this is where most of our small impromptu conversations come, come in as counselors are actually now doing the work to um, help students beyond the Norwalk High School, uh, Norwalk High School and Norwalk Public Schools. Circles are what we were trained in. Um, circles are impactful. We've done workshops at Norwalk High School, and I know Barbara, because uh, I have such a close relationship with Barbara Wood, I know they've done that at, as well at um, Brian McMahon doing the circles. Um, I have a colleague, Louis Sheedy, who works with us at Norwalk High School. Any given day, you might walk past his English class, and he's actually delivering English lessons in circle format, um, just discussing books, discussing literature, and discussing content matter. And this is the most um, structured, and I'll call this very structured because through IIRP, it's very scripted. Uh, we were actually given a script and a book and a manual of exactly what to say and how to say it. Um, you cannot deviate from that script because if you are, you're not really um, giving a restorative conference in the way that they have to um, be conducted. Um, I'll have my re first restorative conference on the 20th of this uh, week, uh, February 20th, and actually Debbie Bell Johnson will be joining us at Norwalk High School for two students, excellent students, who ended up in some major conflict in our, in our community, and we don't want to see them go any further with not understanding one another. So Mrs. Bell Johnson is going to help us through a scripted process through IIRP to do the restorative conferences. Um, uh, and it's, 
includes parents and includes the community um, to ensure that it's conducted well. And at the end, you have to have food because food is, uh, as we learned through IRP, is, is, is a commonality throughout the world. Everyone wants to break bread together. And that's the final culmination as, this, as, the, um, as the script is being producted and as at the end, um, Ms. Bell Johnson will deliver the notes to the committee. Thank you. That's our continuum. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Ellen Knapp, Dean of Students Ponus. Um, this summer, the 12 of us had the opportunity to head out to Evanston, Illinois, to participate in a four-day workshop on restorative practices provided by IIRP. We worked with about 40 other educators from across the nation and actually internationally as well. We were officially trained in restorative practices, running circles, and ultimately um, running our conferences that Mr. Singleton just alluded to that he's running this week. With that information, we all came back to our buildings and were able to start to impart some knowledge on our colleagues. For myself, we have monthly workshops with the staff meeting, or with our staff, excuse me, during the day, during their team meetings. Other buildings have daily circles, and so we've all taken that and made it our own. And now I'll have Mr. Jackson come up for our next steps. Hello. So uh, once returning um, and being able to implement restorative practices to a certain degree after the trip to Evanston, um, we received another level of training, which would make our processes more uniform um, because there wasn't a formalized, agreed upon approach that we were introducing. We all came back. Some did circles in SRBI meetings. Some did circles for as part of a daily routine. Uh, we all kind of picked and, and chose different places where we thought it would be appropriate to introduce restorative practice um, in, our, in our buildings. But af as this uh, three-day process for us to become trainers just came to a conclusion, we brought it into more of a holistic approach for the district. And uh, now we're in the process of planning how to uh, make it not so much that we're the restorative people in our building, but that the building itself is filled with people who are trained in practicing restorative practices. So what does this look like for Norwalk Public Schools? Uh, we had the opportunity to sit down after our certification, our three-day certification, and discuss how we would like to roll this out to our district. So as Lewis said, it's not just something for we're the restorative team. We have people who can deliver this in their building and keep <laughs> it going and make it more pervasive. So some of the things we talked about is starting right away, hitting the ground running. This summer we will offer trainings in the months of July and August. What that will look like, we'll have a team delivering elementary school training, people who are experienced in elementary school, but also people who may have another perspective. And then we will have trainings in the middle school level, and we would like to do that to kind of model how uh, Norwalk is um, divided or how it's um, districted. So Ponis and Roten will be together. West Rocks and Nathan Hill will offer one in July and August. Then the high school teams will offer theirs as well. We also would like to keep that going, the momentum going throughout the school year. And instead of having these trainings, which are really time consuming, uh, we will offer what we're calling, I named it restorative nights. That name is up for discussion. <laughs> but we find that when you're in this space with people who share the same philosophy and passion, you're able to feed off each other. You're able to um, discuss issues. We did fish bowls where we were able to actually share real challenges we're having and um, come to solutions together. And we want to offer that for anybody who's gone through the training during the summer just to keep that going. But our doors will be open to people who are just interested in being a part of that community. So that's really voluntary. And we feel like if people volunteer for that, they, they will be excited and keep that energy going. During the school year also, we will offer building level PDs. We've already talked about how somehow uh, the dean is going to house meetings. Depending on the structures that exist within the building, that is how we'll offer it. If it's afternoon department meetings, if it's lunch professional development, if it's in the building PD calendar, that is how we'll offer it within the building level. And looking forward, you know, we're, we're 
educators. We're always learning and growing. We're looking forward to the next step. The next step for us would be to become certified in conferences. Although we're trained and we know how to conduct a conference, we would like to be certified so we can teach others. What we have essentially done is taken what we experienced in Illinois and brought it home to Norwalk. We don't have to send people outside of the state anymore. We can train our own people and we don't have to pay other people to train our people. So we really have saved the district some money and also some time. So I would like to open the floor for any questions about our learning experience. Well, first of all, shout out to Evanston, Illinois. <laughs> Oh, well. uh, I've, we've got family, a lot of us have family out there, great location to have this. Um, I am very familiar with restorative practices and I think it's fantastic. And a couple suggestions, well first thing I wanted to ask about the I statement, mm -hmm. are you working on that, like Robin for example, of your two high school students, some kind of conflict, you want to have that I statement right away to have some kind of closure, am I correct on that? Yeah. Okay, as much as you can when it happens. And as far as everything you're doing, which hats off, kudos to you and, and the team and going out to Evanston and, and really working on this, because it's a work in progress. It, it requires a lot of time, but also you have to practice mm -hmm. what you've learned. My suggestion is once we have all the training, once you're really, you've excelled and you're doing really well within your own prospective school, I know that you're working on actually having training to other staff members um, in other schools, but maybe I'm thinking of also opening it up at some point to families. So where maybe you have an open house, maybe one is at Newark High School, one is at Niramac, one is at Nathan Hale, but getting family input or parent input is really, really important to really, I think, to make this really successful, or at least handouts or videos or something where parents feel as if they're part of this process because the I statement is so powerful. And having that eye contact with another student if something happens, or even an adult for that matter, but it's almost contagious where everybody in the whole school gets really involved. So I think it's a fantastic program. And, and thank you so much for really working on this and bringing it back to the board. I appreciate your, uh, your feedback. And it is something, that's a dream that I, yeah. I would love to have happen. We did have opportunity to have a parent night uh, through the Rowan PTA, and I was able to do a basic restorative introduction in a circle with the parents. Yeah. Uh, so that was really nice because as we move forward, we have parents from other districts around Norwalk. It was a great opportunity for them to build relationships and get to know each other now that they're working together in a PTA. So your uh, feedback is well received and definitely will be implemented. That's great. Even the PTO meetings, I mean, yeah. it would be great yeah. if you brought yeah. that to families because if a child comes home or a student comes home and says, I used an I statement, a parent probably will understand that, but they'll want more information about it and how it's really streamlined or throughout the school. So it's kind of the culture of the school and really working not only with students, but all staff members, parents that are coming on, but you could feel that positive vibe. So I think this is fantastic. Thank you. I love that, Heidi, the idea of community buy-in, and I know that the Tracy print model has gone home to families. and parents have expressed to me that it's transformed the way that they conduct their daily lives and that we could transform our entire community and the way that we speak to one another. Um, I am curious uh, what we think the footprint will be as you do the train, you know, train the trainer model um, that we're offering this voluntarily. Are we stipending for that? No, um, what we're doing is paying the teacher hourly rate okay. uh, during the summer. Uh, 12 month administrators will not be paid for the training they conduct, okay. but any 10 month employees would be paid at the teacher summer rate. That's great. So do we have, um, at what point will we know how many teachers took advantage of this opportunity so that we can understand how pervasive it's getting? You know, maybe we could have a count at the September meeting of the number of people <coughs> who participated by building so we get a sense of where we might need to apply more building level so we've as a group um, we've set a goal of between 10 and 12 individuals at each of the middle schools mm -hmm. and a slightly higher number at the high schools but again in order for us to effectively permeate the organization we want the folks that are coming to really have some interest in it um, a, a believer in it um, and someone who wants to turnkey it and, and share it when they go back um, by the end of the the last session in the summer, we will have an, an exact count for how many teachers 
We're also talking about non-certified employees. Right. Um, you know, a student's experience, their, their school experience begins when they get on the bus mm -hmm. and ends when they get off the bus. Mm -hmm. And all of the, all of the adults that they interact with from the start of the day until the end mm -hmm. would benefit from, from learning about this approach. Uh, so we should have more precise numbers by late summer. That'd be great. It was really interesting in Joanne Freiberg's training that she talked about, you know, the circles of the school community, and the bus is the kind of the furthest out and the hardest for the administration to monitor and impact the culture there. So definitely enrolling the um, bus drivers in this work in like out years would be incredibly powerful because we could transform the culture on the buses of how, how our kids are dealing with each other in that less monitored uh, space. And to that point, I would also say it would be super cool, seeing as we have representatives from all the schools here, if in the parent programming, there might be an opportunity to present a model mm -hmm. of a restorative circle of an evening, you know, in terms of, you know, yeah. evening programming that's offered at schools. I know it's not, it's hard to get the word out to families about everything, especially mm -hmm. because we're all so saturated with information right now, but I think that it might be a really nice mm -hmm. thing to do, given all the work that you've done. Definitely Frank, value add. Frank, I have a question for you. Sorry. Uh, have you guys thought about when you would establish the goal <clears throat> of reviewing policies that would need to be assessed in order, uh, we're looking at when to target a timeline of change or even implementation, mm -hmm. you know, just <laughs> consistent with some of what was mentioned around reviewing the code of conduct and, you know, change restorative. Um, yeah, I, the question is, you know, what does it look like for when you're looking to assess and kind of look at the level of policies uh, around what would need to be changed? Well, um, I think that's a good question. And restorative practices falls under the larger umbrella of social and emotional learning. Um, so we'd have to think a little bit more thoroughly through how we would want to approach integrating restorative practices work in our policies. And that may take the form of um, a larger curriculum policy where it breaks out social emotional learning generally and then highlights some of our key strategic levers for getting at that work. And one of which is what we're talking about tonight, which is the restorative practices. There are also a separate set of more operational policies that are more discipline focused. And I, I don't recall working on those within the past four to five years. So my guess is that those policies um, do not have restorative language in them. They're probably quite dated. Um, and that would be another avenue for us to take from a policy perspective. Erica, did you have a question? Yeah, well, uh, I was gonna ask Frank to kind of bookend this, just for the community. This is obviously a reactionary process to something that, that occurred, an event that occurred. So you spoke a little bit about social emotional learning, but could you just expand on that and the proactive work we're doing to reduce the amount of instances that do occur? Yeah, in fact, I, I will uh, give uh, someone behind me an opportunity to answer this, but my understanding is that restorative practices is very much proactive work. Mm -hmm. uh, I, what, what it also does is it changes the game in terms of how the adults deal with student incidents as they come in, but that's not all that it provides. So it really does, through, through the effort of the circles and the conferences, the long-term goal when a school has done that for a period of time is it actually begins to shift the mindset of the students and the adults who are participating in the exchanges. So over a period of time, um, an aggressor or a perpetrator may learn, may actually unlearn some of what they're doing as a result of experiencing the response so much differently than they have before. Okay. Thank you for expanding on that. Great. Does anyone else want to ask? Anybody else have any more questions? I have a question. Okay. Sherelle has mm -hmm. a question. I, I, did anybody else want <coughs> to add before I ask my question? If I you, don't think so. Oh, okay. <laughs> so my question, I have to play angel's advocate. So um, do the, stu the teachers or the adults also model the behavior, just say if a teacher um, loses her cool or his cool, do they actually, do they go through the process to model that for the students as well? Well, let me just ask, is there anyone here that's run a restorative experiment or experience with staff? I, I Not, okay. 
because I'm an administrator, I wouldn't necessarily be a part of that process. We would utilize some of our support staff, like a social worker or a counselor, to create a safe space for a conversation to happen between a teacher and a student. And so that also the teacher feels comfortable to be vulnerable without the, you know, about, about being penalized. Um, what I will say is the goal is for everyone to see each other as human and for us to recognize we are all impacted by each other's behavior. So we do welcome those conversations in my building. I'm sure now that all of us are trained, this is the goal for all of us, for us to have those tough conversations, but to talk about how to move forward because that student has to go back to class. And we know that students learn from those who they have relationships with. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Just have one last thing. Last just want to add one last thing. We were talking about how everyone should be involved, right? Just, you know, whether it's certified, non-certified, people that are, kids that are on the bus. I mean, everybody touches every, every child's life. Also thinking we now have chart wells. So, you know, these kids are going through the line every day. They're speaking to somebody as they're going through, even though they're not our employees. That might be something I'm thinking down the road would be important to include them in the conversation, include them in part of this, because I think kids are in lunch line every single day, elementary, middle, and high school. And these adults are speaking to these students every single day. So I think something like this might be beneficial for them as well. I was just thinking out loud about that. We might want to think about that down the road. I, That's a good thought. Um, and also, I just, I just wanted to add, while we were talking about the proactive approach, um, this year at Nathan Hale, we decided to implement circles from day one. So in my day before school training to the staff, I kind of went over what the circles were what they what they do for our children so our goal is to build relationships and make connections with our children every single morning so depending on it doesn't matter what happened over the weekend what happened over the night they are coming to our classrooms and we are greeting them with open arms and it has just made a huge difference in the culture and community at our school this year i'm finding that um, so I don't have a homeroom, so I'm able to get around to facilitate some of the circles. I provide my teachers with a calendar that has a prompt on it for every single day. Some of the homerooms have decided to help me create those prompts. So it could be, what's your favorite snow day activity? So this is how the teachers are opening their homerooms every morning. So we go, we go around the circle, every child shares. It gives the children an opportunity to make a connection with somebody else. Hey, I like to go sledding too. And they're creating, they're just starting conversations with each other. Um, building relationships, making connections, and then those are connections that we look to foster as you know, as the day goes on, as the year goes on. It gives me the opportunity, um, hey, what did you share in homeroom this morning about what you did over break? You know, so the kids, I'm having more opportunities to build more relations with the students, even ones that I teach outside of my classroom. Um, so it's just been a huge success at Nathan Hale this year. That's great. Is there any modifications of the program that would be appropriate for coaches? Instructional coaches? No, um, oh. like sports oh, like coaches. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. um, yeah. Absolutely applies. Okay. It doesn't have a modifier. Yeah. Yeah. So the answer is yes. It is, okay, thank you. <laughs> and, and even I just want to piggyback Great. with our after school programs as well mm -hmm. so that the kids are having continuity in what they're doing. Their conflict um, resolution in school and then right. after school. <clears throat> so, so, so in closing, you know, we're, we are, or you can probably sense the conviction um, in, in the, the spirit behind me. We have carved out about a half a dozen or so summer sessions. Now, the certification uh, programmers, they really look for 20 to 40 participants in one session. So we aren't going to capture the full district in a summer. Um, so this is not a one-time thing, but something that we'll need to continue to, to build toward uh, for the next several summers and, and during the academic year. You Thank doubled you so since the last time you were here. Can you come back again next year and be tripled? <laughs> that's, that's you obviously have the full support of this board in your work, and we thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, they, they certainly deserve it. So we know that when um, the board meetings are getting long and dry, we want to increase your engagement. We're just going to talk about restorative practices. So thank you for your, your comments on that. Um, uh, I want to bring up uh, Diane Filardo and uh, Dr. Brenda Myers uh, for the next item. Um, you're aware that in um, 
your, your March uh, workshop <coughs> is devoted to the uh, results of the Next Generation Accountability Plan. However, uh, for the first time this year, uh, that plan will um, include results of the first state assessment of the Next Generation Science Standards that occurred last spring. Now, for the benefit of new board members, I want to give you a little history on this because this is an important issue for us. Um, historically, on the old CMT science, this was Norwalk's absolute lowest area. Lowest area as a district, lowest area in every school. Uh, we basically were a district at that time that was teaching science from old books, old textbooks. Right? <coughs> Labs were not uh, well utilized, um, no experiential units at the um, elementary level. So um, it was a big undertaking a couple of years ago to develop a plan. Um, and we, our, our results were so low, we knew the state was changing to the next generation standards. There was no point working on the, uh, on the old CMT because it was going to end and our, our results were, were so low. <laughs> Um, so we did start working on the next generation standards and under Tina Henkel's guidance um, You'll recall that we have been for the last two years implementing these units of instruction in the elementary schools if you served on the uh, Curriculum instruction committee you're well aware of this and the uh, progress we've made it's a two-year implementation plan So when our, our students took this test, they did not have the full two years of units um, but yet, I think we were able to see improvement at the elementary level. Uh, at least not as, it's not as, as low as it was. Our middle schools did remarkably well. I think you're going to see what this reveals is, is a tremendous weakness uh, at the high school level. And also some recommendations tonight um, to, as to what to do about that. Um, anyway, Tina, would you, if you, could, uh, if you could start us off. Excellent. Good evening. Tina Henkel, Director of STEM. Um, thank you, Dr. Adamuski. I just wanted to elaborate a little bit on the history and the timeline relative to the transition to next-gen science standards. Ten years ago, um, the National Research Council actually released the framework for science ed education and reform, and that is what kicked off the long-term um, efforts to improve K-12 science education and reform in the country. At that time, uh, a consortium of uh, educators in the K-16 environment, universities, colleges, as well as industry leaders um, from 26 different states came together to design the framework, which is now Next Gen Science Standards. Um, in 2015, in November, that's when the official adoption of the Next Gen Science Standards was available for states to adopt. 14 states adopted the Next Gen Science Standards, uh, Connecticut being one of them. Um, we mention this because as you as you aware, um, for a district to transition and adopt uh, the next gen science standards, it takes several years. Um, it requires great sustained planning, intentional efforts around curriculum transformation, identifying high quality instructional materials, supporting teachers to shift their practice, and ultimately design formative and summative assessments. So, as Dr. Adamowski mentioned, we in Norwalk are committed to this work. And we hope that throughout tonight's presentation, we're going to be able to provide you with Norwalk's timeline around uh, the implementation of science uh, curriculum and instruction in, K in the K-12 environment. And we also want to be able to provide you with a context around what it truly means to design a unit of study and shift curriculum into a three-dimensional framework, which is um, cumbersome and, and takes quite a lot of effort and time. Um, we also mentioned that we wanted to review Norwalk's baseline data relative to the Next Gen Science Assessment, which was officially um, adopted last year for uh, accountability uh, purposes. And then finally, what are our next steps around our implementation plan? Um, so as I mentioned, when you design a unit of study, and I believe in your, in your portfolios in front of you, there's a blue folder, and on the left-hand side, we actually provided you with a grade four unit of study, so you can actually see these four components coming to life. Um, within a unit of study, you will see four main components. You will see a phenomenon, which is um, uh, observable events in nature that students have to um, be able to make connections to 
um, and be able to work to explain those science concepts around the phenomenon throughout the unit. So you'll see phenomenons and anchoring phenomenons throughout the overview as well as within the learning sequences of, of a unit of study. You'll also see a storyline, which is a coherent sequence of lessons that builds over time, and they are all connected to the phenomenon of that unit. You'll see a 5E model, which is um, the design of a lesson for a teacher to implement in the classroom. And the 5Es stand for engage, explore, explain, elaborate, and evaluate. Mm. And finally, you have instructional strategies, which is, as you can imagine, um, what we are focusing on in Norwalk around professional learning and development for our teachers to understand what are the shifts around instructional strategies to impl implement these units of study. So I mentioned in the beginning, um, you know, for an effective plan, um, it does take uh, sustained planning, intentional, intentional planning, intentional effort. Uh, when I arrived last, late, last year in November, um, we had the, a few of the components in place around the implementation. Um, as Dr. Admaski mentioned, we were committed to implementing 50% of the units of study um, throughout the district. This we call it a pilot phase of implementation because we were still learning the units and not all the units were completely designed yet at that point. Um, we were still working on ensuring that students had enough practice around the NGSS assessment prior to the test. And we were working to identify uh, which distributor would be able to provide us with high quality materials to support our unit <coughs> in the classroom. Um, we also wanted to make sure that when we look at our implementation plan, we have high quality professional learning for our staff so that we can provide um, a true science uh, inquiry experience in the classroom. And in a district of our size, it does require uh, sustained improvement over time. And we have to be very intentional around how do we make sure that we, um, we meet the needs of all the staff, which are at varying levels. Um, this year, um, we enhanced our plan um, to include a little more focused uh, planning around the K-8 uh, units of study. This year, we implemented all of our units of study because we revised our curriculum over the summer so that um, we now have 100% implementation this year in K through 8. High school is not completely designed or developed at this time yet. We are working on it this school year and we hope to finish it to 100% capacity over the summer for full implementation next year. Um, we do have a new uh, science materials distributor. Yay. <laughs> um, we have found it to be quite effective um, and part of our um, efforts around identifying quality resources to help implement um, the units of study in the curriculum and in the classroom was to make sure that we had a distributor that can meet all of the varying needs that were identified in a unit of study. Um, you, because Norwalk is a customized curriculum, you cannot go to a company and just say, give me one of those, give me one of those. We are literally designing all of our units of study, K through 12, based on our curriculum, which basically requires us to build kits ourselves. And that is where we are within the next phase of our distribution process with this new company. That's part of the reason why we chose this new company, because now they are in the process of working with us, our teachers, to actually build our own kits. Um, and then last piece here, we wanted to talk about the professional learning. Um, I'm very excited that this year we were able to partner with the Connecticut Science Center. <coughs> we have designed a five-year implementation plan to support all of our teachers. Um, to, the sh to shift um, science instruction in the classroom to next generation science standards um, and also be able to meet them where they are because we know that certain grade levels are, um, uh, they've had more experience to shift some of their instruction and so we know that a district this size, it does take sustained effort to make sure that we touch every teacher, which in turn touches every student. Good evening. I appreciate taking the time tonight to think deeply about our K-12 science program. 
We wanted to start with the opening story just to remind everybody where we've been and kind of where we're going as we look at science implementation. The other thing we want to point out is the science assessment in the state of Connecticut is different than ELA and math because it's really a program evaluation. It is not an annual student evaluation. So in ELA, you can look at growth scores over time, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade. The science assessment as an accountability measure is a program measure. So when we look at the data tonight, you'll see we only test one elementary grade, not every year. The other thing we wanted to show you is when you think about program evaluation and assessing program evaluation, you have to look at the impact model. So I might last year have a group of fifth graders. I implemented 50% of the modules. That was their new learning in relation to next gen. Typically, it takes three years within a program in order to start to see the benefits, right? Because it's a cumulative impact. And a program evaluation, if you look up here, in 1819, our fifth graders had 50% of one year. Now as sixth graders, they'll have a full year. By the time they reach eighth grade in the year 21-22, we'll actually have a measure of how our program is doing because we'll see that three-year implementation. We also are talking the same thing about high school. The a model that we became a part of, which is a statewide project from CREC, um, developed the elementary and middle school modules prior to the high school. So if you can see at the high school, there was a lag in our development. 75% implementation of modules this year, full per, uh, implementation next year. But again, we would want students to have multiple years in strong science programming based on the guidelines in the alignment with next gen. So we're looking at annual improvement each year, increasing the sophistication of implementation, monitoring our success with local assessments annually, but looking at this being a trend line for programs. So the data Diane is going to share with you is going to be a program evaluation based on the state accountability system. Good evening. Good evening. Before we take a look at our test results, we should really take some time to look at our demographics, because that really tells the story. So we see two tables here. So we see grade 5, 8, and 11 for Norwalk, and then for the state. We have the state here because we do compare our results to the state. The bottom shows the number of students that were tested at each one of the grades. Then we see what percent in each of our major subgroups, that 800, let's say in grade five, that 849 students fall. We see the majority of the students that were tested are high need students, 60, almost 69% in grade five, down to 59% in grade 11. If you look at our Hispanic students, see in grade five, particularly grade five and eight, if you take a look at the percent of students that were tested in Norwalk, now jump over to the table for the state, you see that, that those numbers really represent the percent statewide that were white students. It's almost as if our white students and Hispanic students in terms of percentage that were tests are flipped. Look at EL, 16% uh, in grade five in comparison to about 9% statewide. So it's good to have a sense of the demographics of the students that we're testing and that we are comparing ourselves to. Now for the results. We'll begin with the baseline data for grade five. We see the schools in Norwalk listed, and we see district results and state. And this is typical. We report the average scale score. When we talk about Smarter Balanced or Connecticut SAT, we talk in terms of a scale score. So we have one for NGSS. 
And we also talk about the percent of students at levels three and four. The scale scores are divided into levels. And level three represents the students that meet the achievement standard. And level four represents the students that exceed. So we want our students to be at those higher levels three and four. And here we see the percent of ev at every school, district-wide and statewide, that are at the meet or exceeds the achievement level. If you look at the, at the average scale scores of our schools, there were actually four schools that exceeded the state average. State average was 500. So we use scale scores because that really allows for a fair comparison of scores from different test forms. And that's pretty typical when you look at any state results. <coughs> So now at the secondary level, we see comparable tables, again, by school, the average scale score and the percent. And here we see that we have one school that exceeded the state average. Uh, we see that the, the gap here is a little larger between the district and the state. We have to keep in mind that these are students that were exposed to 50% of the units that, as Tina has said, grade 11, you see results again by school. And you can see the percent of students at that higher level or lower, again, remembering their exposure to the actual units. Now, this is another look. Again, we're looking at the percent that meet or exceed the, at the, the standard, but we're looking by major subgroups. In grade five, if you compare the percent of students at the higher levels to the state, you'll see that our Norwalk students that are, were black, Hispanic, EL, free and reduced lunch and high needs, that percent of students, they exceeded their peers statewide in all of those areas. And this is again with 50% of the units. Grade eight, we see that for our EL students exceeded uh, that of the state. And in grade 11, our EL, the low percentage, again, it's a very language-based test, uh, came very close to the state. Now, we, we talk about you know, me meeting levels at three and four, but there's also participation requirements, and we truly did meet that and exceeded the state at all of the grade levels. Now this is another metric, and this is something when we talk about accountability next month, uh, you will hear a lot about, and that's the SPI, the School Performance Index. And what this does, the SPI combines all test scores in a subject into a single performance index. This is what's used by Connecticut's accountability system. And we have an SPI, for ELA that we're looking at. So for example, when we're looking at an ELA SPI, we know that at the elementary level, the students are tested in grades three, four, and five. And this is a metric that combines the results of all of those grades. So you see the SPI for all levels, elementary, middle, and high school for ELA with a ranking among the elementary schools, then among the middle schools, and among the high schools. Then in green, in the green columns, you see the SPI for science. Now, that's one grade at, at, at uh, the elementary level, uh, one grade at middle, and one grade at high school. Again, ranking among the elementary, the middle, and the high. And if you look at those numbers, you're going to see that there really is a relationship between reading and science. For example, um, looking at 
the, the school with the highest ranking, Rowayton, ELA, ranked number one for the SPI in ELA and likewise the SPI in science. Look at a school like uh, Fox Run, we see 12 and 11. Uh, we see, uh, uh, really there's Tracy School ranked eight in, for the SPI in ELA <coughs> and eight for the SPI in science. If you look at our four middle schools, the match is exact. Likewise, for our high school, the match is exact. So you can see just by looking at the units of study that you have in your folders, the amount of reading and the applications. It's not a standard constructed test or short answer test. It really is, as Dr. Meyer says, it really is a program evaluation. Now finally, we, we also like to look at our results in comparison to Connecticut's largest cities. And at grade five, we ranked number three. Danbury and Stanford were ahead of Norwalk. In grade eight, again, we were number three with Bristol and Stanford ahead of us. Again, this is looking at the percent of students at levels three and four. And in grade 11, we ranked number five. Bristol, Danbury, Stanford, and Meriden were ahead of Norwalk. And now I'm going to turn this back over to Tina. We just wanted to know, we, we really took a look and we tried to dig into the high school results a little bit and we worked with our high school team. Um, appreciate the support of our science department chairs and our principals. And we were trying to understand if we took some of our other factors, we have a family of factors. We know what courses kids take, we know what scores they get or grades they get, we know what their SAT scores are. So we looked at families of children to say, um, if they took these courses at higher level in science, were they more likely to score a three and a four? If their SAT score was in the 600, were they more likely to score a three and a four? What do we really understand about the students in 11th grade? We found out a couple of things. Um, we have a very erratic pattern of performance. So we have students who are taking AP science exams, scoring in the 90s and have a 600 on the SAT, and did not score a three or a four on the science exam. So we start to talk a little bit more about test administration. Were students familiar with the testing format? How was the test given? These are 11th graders taking a program evaluation that has no impact on going to college or on getting a grade. So we wonder, can we think a little more about the testing environment? We did not kind of use the SAT model of kind of getting everyone uh, in their rooms, kind of setting the context. So in addition to working on curriculum and instruction issues, we're also tackling um, ensuring students know the importance of the assessment, making sure that the testing environment is really conducive to the testing and the high school setting, and making sure that students have had some practice on preparing for this assessment because we know that children who are struggling in science and have low SAT are struggling on this test but students with mid-range scores and above should not have any trouble when they're tackling this exam. We found out two things in our curriculum though and we are going to point out here in our next steps. Yeah. Our sequence for science instruction we've made a recommendation in the program of study to make that change so that's going to be very important as we think about our three-year sequence. Um, in the program of study, looking at, there's an old tradition called biology, then chemistry, right? And when you look at next gen and you look at the performance of students and the math needed, ideally, um, students would be taking the biology and then they'd be taking earth before they'd be taking chem. There is an accelerated track. <coughs> where we want to get the environmental more integrated, so we really have new course designs for next year. I'll tell you the other thing we're finding in the data, and we're finding this in more than one place, is students need more work in interpreting data, analyzing data, being able to explain data. So what happens is when a student is reading a piece of text and there's maybe visuals within it, graphs and charts, 
then being able to analyze those and explain them next to the text. We need to keep working on that, and we're seeing it in the math as well as the science. And so we've got to put some more instructional modules together to really support that. And quite honestly, it's a, a life skill, right? It's for, for all educated citizens to be able to do that and to live in this more visual world. So as you can tell, the data tells a story and we take it very seriously. And so the slide before that correlates the ELA and the science so closely together, we really want to try to peel back that onion a little bit more relative to the program of studies and, and our implementation plan. So moving forward, there's a couple key pieces that we're going to add as well as sustain over the next two to three years. Obviously, the curriculum design, we need to finish that, especially at the, at the secondary high school level. Um, we also are going to be transforming um, many of our secondary units to integrate content literacy into the, into the units of study so that the strategies that they learn in the ELA classroom come into the science and they're actually using those skills to learn about science through con uh, ELA specific types of articles and high interest um, um, Newzella articles that we already have available to us. We hope that that will help engage and enhance some of the units of study as well. Um, and then finally moving also into next year and, the, and beyond, we're, we're really pleased to have continued our partnership with the Connecticut Science Center um, who has written a grant for Norwalk. So all of the professional learning um, is through that grant so that all of our teachers um, throughout the district will receive professional development opportunities to help support shift not only the instruction, but also learn about assessment design and implementation for the next hopefully three to four years. Um, and then last, my shameless plug again, any opportunity I have to speak in public around our STEM Expo. This is gonna be the one of the opportunities if you have not attended our STEM Expo where you actually get to see some of the units of study um, within that 5E design of lesson uh, implementation where students get to actually engage and elaborate on what they've learned in one of the units of study. And we specifically picked grade four, which is in your packets tonight, which is our grade four STEM unit that you will actually get to see if you judge or come in, um, come in actually, um, you know, participate in our STEM Expo this year. That's the Grade Four STEM Expo unit. So we thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, the floor is open. Any questions? Sure. I don't have a question, but I also I had a chance to um, hang out with you guys just <laughs> before this. I just really want to thank you for the deep dive and the hard work and thinking about um, going a little bit deeper in the data and really thinking about engaging the students and what's going on in the classroom and, and teacher um, preparedness. So I just want to say thank you. Yeah, that's a thank you that echoes around. Definitely. So, thank you so much. Okay. So a lot of work still to be done in the science area. I, I would also point out to you, if you look at the PONUS results, um, PONUS uh, at the time of the old uh, CMT had the lowest math performance and the lowest science performance, which is why it was selected as the site for the um, uh, STEM, now STEAM, uh, design, because we had to do something. It was so low, we had to do something to elevate uh, math and science instruction at PONUS, and so uh, we're looking forward uh, to that. Um, I, I just want to also clarify, there was a comment made uh, earlier during the public comment section that uh, PONUS was not planned well, and, and um, I don't have the furniture, and it's not the right size. Um, it was planned perfectly. Um, it did, uh, it was, the, the budget was um, 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 reduced substantially, I think, Mr. Barbas, you, you remember this, um, by the then city finance director. Uh, so we are building the school that was, um, that was funded by, by the city. But I think, you know, this is just another example that, um, we have to do these things well, the things that we're, we're doing. And, and sometimes it's better to do fewer things and, and, and do, them, do them well um, because the, um, 
<clears throat> as opposed to as opposed to skimping corners and, and, and cutting corners and skimping on, um, on on schools that you know will be with us for another 50 years. So um, finally, I wanted to say a few things about um, the 2021 budget. Um, <laughs> And I have a, I have some good news in this in this environment of the budget debacle of the last two weeks. I have a little good news to to, to share with you. Um, but I did wanted to point out relative to to Ponus, however uh, to Kendall, however you decide, um, you know, uh, relative to the calendar or any other Ponus uh, issues. Um, you know, we we live in a state where the quality of education and the resources devoted to education um, depends on where you live. Mm -hmm. um, and um, this is a, a terrible um, thing that our state is, is dealing with. It's why we have the highest achievement gap uh, in the nation. We cannot replicate that in our own city. If you look at that chart ahead of you, right, we cannot have a system in which our highest performing school that has the fewest number of high need students spends 3,000 more per year than our lowest performing school with the highest number uh, of high need students. This is not justice, it's not equity. Um, and you know, this happens in situations where uh, students and families are poor and they have no voice, right? Uh, this would not happen in some of our other schools. You'd have parents storming uh, the school board. Uh, I wouldn't stand for it. In this case, you, I, we have to be that voice uh, because we have no throwaway children. And these children are just as important as any other child in our, our, our system. So um, in terms of the, uh, of, of the good news, um, I wanted to share something with you. We were notified late <laughs> last week that um, um, the city would be, we would be, the district would be receiving a, um, let me get the number here right, that we would be receiving a uh, $527,000 increase uh, in ECS funds. Now you're probably aware that we have a new ECS formula. Uh, the ECS formula was a product of a bipartisan um, uh, decision on the part of the legislator, legislature, and it, it uh, equalizes funds over a period of uh, 10 years um, between the wealthiest districts and the, the um, um, neediest districts uh, in, the, in, in the state. And um, uh, this was predicted by the Connecticut School Finance Project that we would receive uh, an additional 527000 for next year. Um, this uh, was confirmed, uh, I believe, last Thursday by the, uh, by the state, state Department. Now, I want to point out something that you may not be aware of, particularly new board members. The, in the case of the 30 alliance districts, the increase under the new ACS formula uh, goes directly to the district rather than the municipality, right? And the reason why the legislature did that is because there were instances of municipalities that were taking the money, spending it on other things, or you know saving it in their rainy day fund, right, and not spending it for uh, for for education. And so to prevent that, um, you can do it anywhere else in the state, but for these 30 districts that are viewed as as the neediest districts, it goes directly um, uh, to us. And so um, you know if if you look at our past. Um, expenditure, our entire alliance grant um, has been spent on the curriculum instruction science direct, uh, 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 curriculum CSIDs in the 12 elementary schools. Those are the elementary school principals. Those of you who have experience at, on the board, I think have heard the history of that. Um, the elementary uh, school principals were cut in Norwalk at a, at a certain point. I think it was uh, 2012. Um, and um, uh, Manny Rivera, my predecessor, became superintendent in 2013. Uh, he um, made a proposal to the Dalio Foundation, and they provided the funding for these CSID uh, positions. Uh, the CSID positions were supposed to be instructional uh, in nature. 
uh, not do administrative work necessarily. Um, the uh, the Dalios uh, halfway through the first year were not happy with the way this was being implemented, uh, and ultimately that spring the grant was uh, pulled. Um, and so, when I became superintendent, um, Mr. Connolly was the uh, was the interim, and um, we had we did not have any money. And these people had, all the people were in place. They had not been, uh, they had not been let go or, or rift or, or anything, right? And so um, this was the onset of the Alliance Grant. And so we used the money for the, the Alliance Grant. But prior to this time, we have been stuck, um, you know, using this grant um, to close the gap for elementary assistant principals. This is an excellent <coughs> example of what happens when you don't spend at a level relative to other districts, right? Stanford pays for its elementary principals out of its local budget. Um, all the districts around us that are contiguous us pay for their assistant principals out of their local budget. We have not been at a, at a uh, level of expenditure high enough to do that. So we've been using the precious resource of the Alliance Grant, which, as you'll see on the, on the next page, is supposed to be used to support district strategies to dramatically increase student outcomes and close achievement gaps by pursuing bold and innovative <coughs> reforms, right? Well, we finally have a chance to, uh, to, to do that, at least with this additional uh, 527,000. Um, there are several core areas of the Alliance Grant. These are all uh, categorical grants. So in other words, they have to be spent for a specific purpose that the state uh, defines. Uh, and in this case, there, you, you'll see on the, on the next uh, page, um, you know, there are, are 10 of these. Um, but um, we have been concentrated on number eight, uh, which is the implementation of the um, um, core, uh, core uh, curriculum standards, which is what the CSIDs do, in addition to being assistant principals, essentially. Um, however, the, um, you know, some of the, the key core areas are additional learning time, either extended day or extended year, tiered system of intervention, and I think you're aware that summer school is our only tier three intervention, at least the only one that we, we can afford. Uh, and minority uh, teacher and administrative re recruiting. We have been urged by the State Department to do more in the area of minority uh, teacher and administrative recruiting and to use our alliance grant to uh, uh, fund that. So I think the good news as you look at the, the rest of your agenda tonight is that the increase in the ESC, in the ECS through the alliance district funding would enable funding of some of your um, board budget and policy goals outside of the local operating budget. Uh, the Kendall balance calendar, for example, is five additional days of instruction at 227,000. That can be funded through the Alliance grant because it is, it is one of the areas of focus. Um, that can be backed out of the 478,000 when you get to budget re reconciliation, right? So, uh, you don't have to pay as much out of the local uh, budget. Seventh grade summer school, which is, again, our only tier three intervention, can be paid in its entirety from the uh, Alliance grant. And my, that leaves us 128000 for minority recruiting, which means we can um, uh, hire a, a minority recruiter uh, and they can take a couple uh, recruiting uh, trips to areas of the country where um, the, the results of, of uh, recruiting minority teachers and administrators have been most uh, fruitful. So I wanted to bring this, attention, this to your attention. It's a little bit of good news. And again, I, I want to also take this opportunity to thank our state legislative delegation, uh, Senator Duff, Representative Laviel, uh, Representative Dalton, uh, Perone, Representative Sims, and Representative Wood. <laughs> Uh, for enabling these opportunities for uh, Norwalk's most underserved students. So I just want to just confirm students. your yeah. recommendations of how to spend it are on the first page. Mm -hmm. But as an example, we could use it to fund goal 
three. Correct. Correct. That was Thank my you. thinking as well. Okay. You use it to fund what? So oh, right. Right. Yeah. the math is that the 9.9 .9 that the city is offering, which is really 8.9 .9 because we are not getting the 1 million for the special appropriation, really gets us to the bottom of goal two. The extra ECS money one could consider as a, you know, inflationary growth, um, as Mr. Barbas has pointed out. And, uh, you know, we, we are required to cover those salaries of those mandatory ELL programs. So I think as we consider how to use that money, which is truly part of our ECS allotment, even though it's delivered through the Alliance, Grant, we have to consider what's the best use that's going to impact the most students, and especially in regards to Tier 1 and Tier 2 instruction. Is there any further discussion about that? Do we want to? So, okay, so let, let me just clarify that a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, as you know, one of the budget challenges you are facing is the fact that the city budget director took out or essentially ended the special appropriation <coughs> and is forcing you to, of course it's the children are still with us, right? But they're forcing you <laughs> to that uh, take that out of your budget increase, mm -hmm. right? So <coughs> these are, as you point out, mandated uh, services. Mm -hmm. um, this number 10, which was recently added, uh, nine and 10 were recently added. Um, is designed to enhance, and I think what, what they're saying with bilingual programs is, you know, bilingual is one of the enhancements that was recommended in our plan, right? Mm -hmm. That and the co-teaching and so on. This is not the fundamental ELL services. So the special appropriation pays for that. It just expanded those for the number of, of students. And that was basically uh, ESL. Right, um, uh, methodology. So I think the grant could be used to pay for enhancements, mm -hmm. uh, but not the, um, not the, um, so the career, areas that the special appropriation is covering. So the career pathways facilitator, the TESOL training, and the supplies? Perhaps. No, I don't, this is this is designed. You know, you, not not supplies. No, you, this is designed yeah. for district strategies to dramatically increase student outcomes and close achievement gaps by pursuing bold and innovative reforms. Mm -hmm. This is not uh, for doing the things that every community should do, mm -hmm. like buy supplies for its uh, students. Okay. Just taking the temperature of everybody, would we like to take a five minute recess to just walk around and stretch our legs before we move into voting on these things or would we like to power through? Probably a good idea. A recess, walk around? Yeah? Right. Five minutes, okay. May I have a motion for a five minute recess? <laughs> okay, may I have a second? Any of second. you guys all in favor? Five minute recess. <coughs> okay. I need to move. Oh, I need to go okay. to the bathroom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can have mine. I have a lot of fluids. Are you sure? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Water we are actually. I don't know if it might be. Yeah, I think um, it comes from water. I think it's a bomber I never would have passed along no, 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 the, um, no, 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 no. the translating thing if I knew that. I would have just told them, no. <laughs> well, I think what you were saying is that he said what he was just saying that the are the yeah.